Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Traders Summit. It's about COVID, stimulus, and the U.S. elections. And we're going to start off with a special edition of FACE. There's mine. Hi, Blake. Hey, Dale. I, you know, I was about ready to put on my mask, but I decided against it, so. Uh, well, you know what, Blake? I thought about it. Let's see. You're in another state. Yes. And our partners are in Greece. And Correct. Joe's on the East Coast, so we're, we're, uh, we have social distancing going on for this. What, I think we're good. Day. Yeah, we're good. You and I have about 400 miles apart from each other. All so right. So uh, I'm really excited about the lineup that the team has put together. Um, you know, we've been putting on face. We're going to have a little bit of a special edition to give you an understanding of what we've been doing every morning where Blake and I get up before the roosters and have a free webinar to serve the community and uh, talk about what's happening in the markets. The whole team gets involved. Um, there's an interview almost every day uh, since FACE has been on the air three and a half years. I believe Steve told me last April, I was up to about 750 interviews. So between now and then, plus FX Street, I would say I've interviewed over a thousand traders, analysts, educators, the best of breed on the globe. And our mission every day in face is to build up and edify traders. And we lay it all out there on the court for you because we're on your side. We're here to support you. We root for you. And it's important for us because we're like you, for you guys to make it avoid the mistakes that we have made. And um, I'm very satisfied with the work that we've done over the last three and a half years. This is an expansion of what FACE started out to be because we've built a network of excellent uh, analysts and traders. And why not have a huge event and compress it into a few days so that um, with what's happening in our world right now, it's not a joke that I had a mask on. Um, it's not a joke what's happening here. We have crossed a different paradigm. And my hope for everyone listening or even viewing the recording later, that there's one idea that you get one idea that could be life changing for you, that could help improve your trading style that if you're having difficulties, that a new paradigm develops for you from this. And I welcome everyone here. Thank you for your attention. We're going to make it worth your while, I promise. Blake, how are you today, partner? You know, I'm doing great, Dale. I'm, I'm super excited about, about what we're doing here with, uh, with Trader Summit and the conference. Um, there, you know, like you had mentioned, this is a special edition of FACE. And for those of you that don't and are not aware, we do a daily broadcast um, every single day um, for, for free. Uh, we, we, we broadcast and we talk about the markets and what's moving. And um, it's not just myself and it's not just Dale. You can see uh, we have actually our two other um, target employees that are here I'm joking, guys. You're wearing red shirts, and um, if you wear a red shirt, if you guys have khakis on, you would be uh, target employees. What um, aisle do I find the euro on? Steve? Right. Um, I you know, want to. These guys are these guys are from Athens, uh, Greece, and we and our team actually is is great because it spans all over the globe. Um, we have, um, you know, we have Polly in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we have Joe in New Jersey, New York, New Jersey. We've got uh, uh, Andre in Portugal. We've got Grega, who's in, um, he's in uh, Slovenia. Or, hey, yeah. Or, or Croatia, wherever, and there, there's Joe. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have Amanda in, in London. Um, we have uh, Leandro, who's in Spain. We have uh, 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 Jane, who's in Spain. Belu, who's in, where is Belu at? Hungary? No. Finland, uh, Finland. <laughs> Finland. <laughs> 
totally messing with you, Blue. Anyway, we yeah. have uh, we have a, a great group of, um, of traders and 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 guys and gals that work on on everything that happens behind the scenes um, to make it happen every single day. And uh, we offer analysis in the markets, and it's not just currencies. I know Forex Analytics, uh, who who um, you know, I'm I'm one of the co-founders of Forex Analytics, but uh, we we don't just cover currencies because there's a lot of things that move the currency market. We cover precious metals and what's happening in the bond market and fixed income and what's happening in the S and P's. And what I've um, uh, if I if I look prior to um, Forex Analytics. Uh, I was the chief currency strategist at MB Trading, uh, which eventually became, uh, well, went to Ally Financial. Um, and prior to that, you know, through other iterations and other companies, um, uh, before that, we used to do a webinar called the, um, the Morning Edge. And I had so many traders that weren't currency traders, but they, but we do them, we do it, you know, early in the morning before the market opens. And so a lot of people could get a good feeling of what the market was going to do throughout the course of the day based on what we were seeing in the futures market, what we were seeing in currencies, because as you, as most of you know, um, the currency markets really could, can influence what's going to happen the rest of the day. And we take a you know, macro perspective of the market, technical perspective of the market, and put it all together. And that's what really um, uh, created Forex Analytics. Now, um, I, I do want to take a little bit of time to kind of give you a flavor of what my view of the markets might be and, and, and getting opinions from, from other uh, other, other people on the team that you can see here, like with Steve and Stelios and Dale, uh, and, and, and maybe even Joe, if he wanted to throw in something. Um, but the, the, the point is I want to show you kind of the process that we go through every day. And just remember it's free. You can, you can tune in anytime you want and we'd love to have you there. Uh, I will show you Forex analytics. Um, the, we are, uh, uh, uh co-sponsor and an organizer of, of the Traders Summit. It's the only time you're really gonna hear about Forex Analytics. We'll be uh, here in a little bit. I just wanna show you what it does. And um, you guys can take advantage, of, obviously, if you want to. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, tra Traders Summit and where it's going and how it's going to be evolving in the future. Um, and we do have other partners that are helping us develop uh, um, the Trader Summit, which um, many of you know, Forest Park FX, and you've worked with them. They're a wonderful, wonderful group of guys, which you'll hear from a little bit later because they are also um, co-hosting this event with us. Uh, they've been great at helping our traders find the right broker. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, guys. I, I've, I've been trading the markets for over 20 years. Um, my trading style has actually changed over the last few years because uh, for those of you that don't know, I trade um, for another, I traded for a firm as well. And so my size of the way that I trade now is more institutional. So um, my style of trading has actually changed a little bit over the years. And what you'll find as a trader or as an investor in the markets is you will, you will evolve. Um, and you will change. I was more of a, you could call me like more of a retail trader, even though I was, you know, chief currency strategist for so many years, I traded my own money. And, uh, and, and so I, you know, I would trade relatively, I mean, if you think about it, uh, more of an everyday person, everyday investors size in the market. Um, and I could, I could afford to be a little bit more loose in the way that I approach the markets um, from, a, from a risk reward standpoint. But now that I trade bigger, bigger size, I tend to be a little bit more focused on, you know, the, 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 the minutia and the little moves of the, of the markets. And as you evolve as a trader, that's going to happen. And finding the right broker to, to complement what you're doing is super important. And that's why Forest Park FX has been, you know, a wonderful partner of ours uh, over the last how many years guys probably like four or five years and yep. 
and they've yeah and they've really helped our traders you know um, 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 move along in a positive fashion always being there to support them and um, tackling any issues they might have <clears> with their specific broker they're working with so uh, there's a there, there's a lot um, that I do want to speak about today um, but before I show you you know kind of Forex analytics, the charts kind of show you how I approach the market, how our team approaches the market every day. Are there any comments that you guys would like to uh, to make before I get started? Well, I'll tell you something, Blake. I, I have a testimonial. I've become a much better trader being part of the team in the last three and a half years. I can't even uh, list all the things I've learned from listening to uh, Steve every morning and you and uh, going over the research that we get from the team, Greg and Andre, and uh, people that remember me from, say, you know, five, six years ago where, you know, I was much more inconsistent, um, a lot less disciplined. And, you know, I teach surround yourself with traders better than you. And so I lived it being part of this team over the last three and a half years. You know, and, and uh, Dale, I can appreciate that. One thing I want to say about um, Dale, I, you know, I, I first met you on Twitter probably about eight to 10 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And we've been uh, very fortunate to have you be, become part of this team because uh, you interview so many great traders. You, there's, a, you know, there's a gentleman that, that's going to be a speaker, uh, I forget what day, Saturday or Sunday, Jack Schwager, um, the great Jack Schwager, by the way. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned on Twitter, if you guys follow me on Twitter, I mentioned that uh, he was one of the, the original Market Wizards book was one of the first books that I ever read. And um, whenever I'm struggling in the markets, I kind of take a step back, which, you know, we all do in the markets. You have ups and downs and you have good times and bad times. And when I'm struggling to, to make sense of the markets, uh, a lot of times I'll sit back and I'll read Market Wizards, which happens to be behind me up on a shelf. But um, the reason why I, I read that book is because even though it was, it was, uh, written and it was, uh, all the interviews were back in the late eighties, early nineties. I think it was, it was published in 89, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, it's all timeless. Those, uh, I'm sorry. It's timeless. It is timeless because the, the emotions that the traders go through are the same emotions and, and, and issues psychologically that, that, that you will experience today. Obviously, the times have changed, but we all still psychologically, we still deal with, deal with the same things. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is because Dale is an encyclopedia of knowledge. He's interviewed so many people over the years, uh, and I, he interviewed me um, probably on well, FX well, Street. Ago. Yeah, on FX Street, four or five years, six years ago. I don't yeah. know how long ago, uh, uh, several times. But you've interviewed so many people over the years, and he's such a book of knowledge and that's what makes it extremely valuable when we're going through our analysis and he's like you know Blake I was I just had so and so on that was talking about you know the growth of money supply and how it might affect the currency market in this way and then we'll talk about that uh, specific topic uh, as we're going through the analysis process every single day so I, I think I think it's I think it's great that you're you're with us Dale so it's intelligence you. gathering Yep, you know, I mean, call. they do it in the government. They do it in the military. As traders, I think it's uh, very valuable to do intelligence gathering. 100%. And we're glad that you you do that um, for <laughs> our community. Uh, Steve Stelios, anything you guys want to mention before I, I take over the screen and uh, plug away at some charge, charts? Excuse me. No, we just, uh, you know, we're just here um, as participants mostly. We want to wish everybody um, an enjoyable event. I'm pretty sure they, they, they will, uh, you know, they will enjoy um, all three types um, of um, uh, things we produce here, which is interviews, uh, presentations, and of course, the big debate that we have tomorrow. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to all of it, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 um... It, it's it's great. <laughs> the the debate tomorrow is going to be absolutely epic. So I'm I'm excited about yes. that. Yes, yes, it's going to have a little bit of everything. Yeah, Stelios. 
No, I'm, I'm also very happy to be here. And uh, in fact, I just saw on the chat, uh, there's somebody from university I haven't spoken to in 28 years. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's enjoyable and I hope everybody enjoys it and I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. <laughs> well, well, guys, without further ado, I'm going to take it over to the charts and I'm, a, I'm going to, um, let me go ahead and share my screen really quick. I got to take this opportunity to mention our sponsors because this is going to be, you know, this is a free event, obviously for you guys um, for the next several days, and um, and you know it it only happens because of our sponsors. So uh, you can see I'm actually on the on the on the screen here, and I want to take a little bit of time just to talk about them. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom uh, to talk about them. One of our, our our main sponsor here is Pepperstone Securities. Pepperstone Securities, uh, we have developed a relationship with them over the last six months or so, and we're going to be working with them hand in hand, uh, Forex Analytics, I should say, um, uh, producing content. Uh, we've got uh, Spanish webinars that are going to be uh, hitting the market for the Latin America community. Uh, we're all very excited about, um, about the future between Pepperstone Securities and Forex Analytics specifically. So make sure you visit them. And if you want to learn how to potentially get Forex Analytics for free for a certain, for, for a period of time, depending on you know, how much live trading you do, uh, make sure that you visit um, when you're on Forex Analytics, there's their um, Forex Analytics sponsored uh, page where you can learn about how you can, how you can get Forex Analytics um, you know, possibly, like I said, for free for, for a period of time. So make sure you check that out. And, you know, you have to be, you have to be outside of the United States or Canada to take advantage of that particular offer, which we have a lot of European and Asian traders, uh, you know, uh, some in the Pacific Rim. And so just check it out and, 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 and see if it applies to you. But we have many other sponsors and I urge you to please Take this opportunity um, sometime over the next three days and visit visit them uh, and, and see what they're all about. Because like I said, without them, we couldn't offer this event to you guys. Uh, so I, I wanted to make sure I did a little bit of housekeeping regarding um, regarding our sponsors because they are they are extremely valuable to, to the Trader Summit organization and what we do. All right. So let's talk about the markets uh, really quick, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit into forex analytics to kind of explain why uh, I developed forex analytics with uh, our my partners here. Um, but I want to explain to you guys that every day, every day, I'm a trader and I do carry positions. You know, sometimes for a couple of days, sometimes for a couple of weeks, depends on the situation. Um, like right now, I happen to be running a long dollar Canadian um, trade because uh, it's an inverted head and shoulder pattern. Uh, for those of you that you know are Forex Analytics subscribers, you're very much aware of this. Uh, it's been on my radar for the last month because we broke this, you know, this downward sloping channel, and uh, we started de developing this inverted head and head and pa head and shoulders pattern. Excuse me. Um, and and when it broke out and broke the neckline above 132.30. That's basically when I started to get a little bit more aggressive. And um, the, the reason why I'm showing you this particular chart is because the currency market can tell or maybe complement from a correlation standpoint what is happening in the market in, in equities as well. And if you trade equities, you probably, and you, and you watch our, our daily face webinar, you know that I've been leaning on the equity markets a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Uh, technically, you know, I think it was on everybody's radar that we were, we, you know, we had this megaphone pattern. Uh, I was looking at this AB equals CD pattern uh, a couple different ways. Um, we reached the 127% extension of, of this, you know, post COVID sell off. And so it was really important as we were trading up at uh, 35, 3600 that I started to see the market show a little bit of a reversal here. And the reason why I felt strongly that we were going to see a little bit of a reversal was not because I, exactly what I was seeing here, but it was more 
as a response to what currencies were doing. When you start to see the dollar, you know, like, uh, you know, we, we can talk about the dollar index as well. You know, you see the, the dollar index as a whole, or you see some of these uh, major currencies like the dollar Canadian start to give you a bottoming or topping in some cases like the Euro, some sort of reversal pattern. We know that the dollar is strengthening and why is it strengthening? Well, when you live in a world, um, which we all do right now, where all central banks are basically at ZERP, all the major central banks and, and, and most, um, and some and NERP for you know, negative interest rates in some cases, but you have a, a situation where every major economy is, is bringing their interest rates to zero. It's hard to get the currency market to move because you know, what's gonna move the currency market when you have everything at zero? Well, the reason why the dollar may start to percolate is because it is used as a risk off proxy. And when there's no, you know, that meaning that it is the reserve currency of choice. So when people feel that the, you know, the, 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 the stock market has maybe gone up enough for a lot of different reasons, you know, um, which, you know, actually I'm on the next interview, with Daniel DiMartino Booth, I'll be talking about maybe some of the reasons why um, the Fed uh, has done what it's done and, 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 and maybe the consequences of that. But more importantly, once the dollar started to show some signs of life, we knew that, or at least we're confident that, that the equity markets might start to show some, some you know, topping patterns. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to it than just that. And those are things that we, we cover on a daily basis. But one of the things that I love to do on a daily basis is I love to go through a process. And I go through each, you, you can see this, uh, this what we call the, the bias chart. Uh, the bias chart is basically, you know, all the major currency pairs, you can see gold in the S&P, do analysis on that as well. And we try to find out where the major key levels based on, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty, I'm a simpleton kind of guy. I, I look at basic technical analysis for those people that have listened to me for the last 15 years, you know, that my analysis doesn't change. I look at the same stuff now than I did, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, obviously I, it's sprinkled in with a lot of cross market analysis. Uh, I, you know, you know, we take in what's happening on a, on a mat in the macro environment to help come to some sort of con conclusion of how we feel about the currency markets. But we, I go through these charts every single morning with our entire group. So anybody that's listening into the face webinar intraday, you're going to get the analysis of all of these major currency pairs, plus the indices, plus the S and P and a lot of people ask me, well, well, Blake, why, why do you, why do you do that? And, and you know, why, why don't you just do it for yourself? And, you know, cause I trade for a firm, why don't you just do it like that? You know, you know, one of the benefits, um, and, and Dale, Dale, you know, the answer to this question, if you're still there, are you still listening in or maybe Steve or Stella? I am here, mate. Okay. I am. So, uh, yeah, I just, why don't. do you think I like to go through this analysis process every single day with our traders knowing that I trade for a firm and I'm trading relatively decent size why do you think well because it reinforces things that um, especially when you write them down it's NLP uh, if you just have a thought in your head it's not as potent as if you're writing it down it imprints exactly. on you right it's yeah it's it's that uh, and increases your commitment to your beliefs uh, it and you're makes accountable it, and you're yeah. showing it to the public it makes you accountable for your ideas exactly it makes it harder to vi deviate from your plan following it. it 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 really does and you guys are 100 percent correct look there are times and uh and and the guys know this where i have to bow out early um i you know we're i'm going through the analysis process and things start moving and i've got to start managing my positions, uh, you know, I've, I'll, I'll take a position and, you know, I know where my risk is and I know what I'm looking for to get out of a trade. Uh, you know, my risk reward is all relevant, but 
there are a lot of times that the markets move sporadically and, you know, uh, uh, sometimes against my will, uh, whether it was due to some sort of tweet or news news event or some sort tape of headlines. Uh, what's that? Tape bombs. Yeah. Tape bomb. Oh, look, I, I, I have, I have Bloomberg on my, on my, computer that you guys are you know viewing right now this is one of many screens that you see but this is like my 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 bloomberg headline uh and sometimes these red headlines come across and uh when they do they hit the market it's like holy cow the market just starts moving and a lot of times i'll be trading i'm like guys hey can you take over i'm i'm typing on skype you know hey take over the screen i gotta go um but for the most part I'm doing this analysis in the morning before you know before the equity markets open in North America. So, um, you know, it's I don't want to say it's a slow period because it's a crossover between European and and North American markets, but it is a, a time where usually the European traders are taking a little bit of their profits or losses off the table ahead of the North American session starting. So when we when we start in the morning, which is 8:30 in the morning. East, is it eight o'clock Eastern? So I'm trying to think of the times yes. in my head. Eight, yeah, because it's five in the morning for me. Um, at, at eight o'clock in the morning Eastern, that by that time, you know, all the North American traders are already in front of their computer and they're they're starting to, you know, they're starting to position themselves for the day. You know, European traders are taking positions off the table and whatnot. So um, for me, it, it's really important to do this analysis process every day because what I found, uh, and I've done it. If I don't have a process as a trader, if I don't have a process and I'm not held accountable, I suffer monetarily the consequences of that. So by doing the analysis for you or, you know, the viewers, it allows me to say, okay, you know that, you know, look, I know that the Euro dollar at 117 is a big resistance level. Uh, I know it's a level that, that, that that's going to influence what I'm doing. And so I need to adhere to that. And so throughout the course of the day and throughout the course of the afternoon, I'm constantly looking at, especially as, as we approach it, I might be looking at that 117 level in the Euro because I know it's key resistance. And then I know that as we approach 116, it's really important support because I already wrote it down. And like right now we're trading at 116.17. Granted, it's a Friday. You're not going to catch me trying to short the Euro right now, even if it was a Thursday or even if it was a, uh, a, a Monday, I probably wouldn't be shorting the euro because I know it's so close to support. Or if I did, I'd be very careful knowing that support is so close to it. So knowing, <coughs> excuse me, knowing where these important levels are in the market is very important to me and and for all of our traders. I, I know, I know. Uh, how, about, how about this, Blake? Don't try and make your don't try and make your week on a Friday. How about that? Yeah, true, true. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I, I want to say the last Trader Summit event that we did, Steve. I I, I want to say you did it during the week, and I was like, yeah, I'm like, no. <laughs> yes, but to be honest, circumstances were very special uh, yeah. because it was the period that most of the uh, countries of the world were in lockdown. Uh, so we knew that people are actually there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and it, I, you're right. We did uh, we did the the last or, or our initial Trader Summit event during the um, COVID lockdown, right when it started. So you're correct. Um, so let me let me uh, kind of and for those of you that follow me on Twitter, uh, I always like to say this: if if you're on Twitter, you probably get about five percent of what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, if you're if you come to the face webinar, you probably get about another 20 25 percent of what I'm thinking. But the rest of the time um, and and to get most of my thoughts and my ideas, uh, that's what that's where you know Forex analytics really comes into play. And so let me take a moment and talk to you guys about Forex analytics. Remember we are um, one of the core uh, one of the organizers for Forex uh, for the for the um, Traders Summit. Uh, I, I, I needed to talk a little bit about Forex analytics and about what we do, but I, what I really wanted to do is tell you why, why we created it and, and, um, and, and what was happening at that moment. So about um, five, four or five years ago, uh, 
I, I knew that MB Trading was being sold to Ally Financial, and um, and I, I happen to know the, the the owner of MB Trading uh, and worked with them obviously for many years. Uh, and I and I said, look, I, I, Steve, I don't I'm, I'm don't want to really be part of Ally Financial. It's a big organization. I'm you know, I, I'm more better suited for a smaller organization. Um, you know, I'm, I, and I, I don't really want to be this cog in this big, you know, machine. And he's like, I get it. I'm like, look, I'd like to create something on my own, but, I, I, you know, and, and I told him what I wanted to do. And he's like, well, you know, they, they, they mostly deal in equity. So, uh, you know, I'll just make sure it's not a conflict of interest. And so I started to, uh, this idea of Forex analytics and I met with my partners, uh, Steve and Stelios, which you, you see here. Uh, in in Greece, and uh, and I started down this path, and then um, then at the same time I met the group that I trade for uh, right around the same time. But I already started down the path of building forex analytics, and the reason why I wanted to build it is to build a community for the traders that I've met over the last you know previous 12, 15 years uh, prior. I just wanted to build like a a, a platform that was. Uh, something that was affordable for every trader out there because not one shoe fits every person. We have so many different types of traders that come from so many different backgrounds, so many people that have $5,000 accounts, so many people that have you know $50,000 accounts and they, they, they trade the markets differently, they approach it differently. You know, So I wanted to make something that was affordable for everybody, but also a safe place for individual traders to go that were in the currency market predominantly to, to go to. And so that we, so here came Forex Analytics. And uh, what, what it is, is basically it's an analysis product that shows multiple types of analysis. Uh, uh, let me move this out of the way. It, 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 multiple types of analysis, macro, candlestick, basic technical, harmonic, Elliott wave analysis for individual currency pairs and 30 different instruments. We even cover some cryptocurrencies in here. And, um, but what's really the backbone of Forex analytics is, you know, not just the technology, which you have an app and, you know, you can, you, you get notified when support and resistance levels are breached and it goes to your phone. And it's nice if you have, you know, if you're on the move as currency traders, we're in, we're in the markets 24 hours a day, but my kids soccer practice or school, it doesn't matter, uh, that I'm a currency trader that, that, life happens. So I happen to be mobile. It's nice to be notified when I'm on the run, you know, when something's moving. Um, and, and it's not always easy doing analysis on a phone anyway. So being notified when things are moving is really important. So whenever we upload analysis, uh, you can see in the live stream here, whenever we upload analysis, this analysis will get launched to your mobile phone and you know, you'll get the chart, you'll get the corresponding analysis. Uh, when support and resistance levels are breached, so on and so forth. But what's what what is really cool about our platform is not necessarily the platform itself, which is I think it's nice. But what's really great is our community, and this is the Forex Analytics chat room. And uh, you guys are all on Jumbotron for those of you that uh, are are in there right now. And uh, you'll see we have currently sixty four of us online. You can see we ch chat and talk all day long in this community. Uh, you can see all of the different charts that we're posting throughout the course of this course of the day and you know what charts and the corresponding analysis. And this is a place that you know my wife likes to say I spend more time with my traders than I do with uh, our own family, but it's kind of true. Uh, because I'm in here all day long, and you can see uh, people are listening in right now, and they're they're um, to to this uh, to this event, uh, and they're in the chat room as well. But that's really, in my opinion, probably where the value lies in Forex Analytics is our community. And so um, I wanted to explain that to you guys, uh, kind of the backstory of why how Forex Analytics uh, came to be, and it's 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 uh it's it's grown. Um, a life of its own, if you will. We have a great team. We have a great community of traders, and um, you know, the, and and I have to, you know, tip my hat to all the guys and gals that are are associated with Forex Analytics, and and now the Traders Summit as well. So, um, so thank you all, especially my partners that are listening in right now. But what's great is having a place where you know 
I, I do the analysis for Forex analytics for a lot of the, you know, analysis that you'll see on the platform, but I am mature enough as a trader being that I've been trading since 1996 is when I actually start trading. I started in the business uh, a couple of years prior to that as a stockbroker. Stockbrokers actually don't even exist now. I think they're called wealth managers now. But um, uh, when I started in the business or as a trader, I probably was a little bit more, well, I was obviously a lot younger at the time, but I've grown, I've matured enough uh, over the years to really respect what other traders are sharing and doing because we all have different viewpoints in the marketplace and we all have different, you know, there are different things that I'll see that maybe somebody won't see or they'll see that I, I wasn't even looking at. And that's the value of having a community, especially when you do this full time, when you trade full time, it's having a community where you can go, Hey, you know, this is what I'm looking, I'm looking at this in the, uh, in the, in the, in the dollar Mexican peso right now. And you know, it's ripped up past it's uh, it, it's 200 day moving average. How are you guys feeling about, you know, the dollar Mexican peso at this time and getting other people's opinions about it. And they might see something that I'm just not seeing. So uh, that, that in my, in, in essence, I, I feel is probably the most beneficial um, part of Forex analytics. So again, uh, I just want to reiterate what I do is I go through, you know, the process, um, you know, going back to the charts, I, I go through, I go through all of the different indices. I go through, you know, some of the major currencies knowing how they move, why they're moving. And as a trader, I, and I, and I, I, I say this all the time, but I, but I'm, you know, this is kind of how it is as a trader. I feel like every day when I get up, I, I'm, 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 I've got a puzzle, a big jigsaw puzzle in front of me with all the pieces laid out. And I've got to put all the pieces together every morning, see how it all fits and try to make a decision based on the information that has you know, been laid out for me or all the puzzle pieces that I have. And that's what going through this process, the analysis process and looking at all of, you know, try, I try to look at every asset class, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, for the most part, if it's moving anyway, and understand the reasons why it's moving. And then how does that translate to the currency market? And how am I going to capitalize on, on that for the day? And you know what, Dale and everybody else uh, that's, that's, that's here right now, it, there, there, always, there is an, a trade always developing every day, you know, and some days, uh, you know, are quieter than others, but some days sure are busier than others. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, um, less is more, in my opinion, Blake. I'm sorry. Less is more, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah you know, as far as and, trading, you know, yeah, I'm I'm, and, and, I'm happy to find a couple good ones a week. Yeah, and and that's um. So I'm I'm glad you brought up this uh, topic, and then I'm going to switch gears over to Trader Summit and talk a little bit about Trader Summit as well, uh, and and where it's evolving and how it's it's going. One of the things that we focus on on our daily face webinars is, you know, is really focusing on obviously the charts and, and why uh, things are moving, but where they could go and where potential turning points are going to be. And so for me as a trader is always identifying what's the best risk versus reward. And it isn't always clear. As you, as you pointed out, you know, there's, there's, you know, a couple of good opportunities a week. I would probably agree with you. There's a couple of great opportunities every single week or, you know, a couple of really stellar ones throughout the course of the month that you can really take advantage of. And those are the ones that, um, you know, I, I, I look at trading as where do I step into the market and where do I aggressively step into the market based on probabilities and risk versus reward because you don't always have the best risk reward setup. Like I could sit there and, and say, you know, the Euro in my opinion is going down to 115, but that doesn't mean that if, you know, I think the Euro, and by the way, if I'm looking at the Euro dollar, just so, so you guys know why I do think it's going down to 115 is because I think it's going down to this 38% retracement um, longer term. Let me, let me move this fib level here. You can see this is a, a more of an intermediate fib, which is a 618 retracement. Okay. 
And the longer term Fibonacci's come in around the 38% retracement, I also know as a breakout point. So I've got like triple confluence there. So in my view, I think the Euro dollar is gonna drop, you know, get down to 115. You might ask me, well, Blake, am I gonna be a buyer down at 115? And my answer is gonna be, it depends because it depends what's happening on more of a, a, a macro environment and, and what you know, other asset classes are doing at that moment. But for right now, I think it's going to 115. So the next question that I'm always asking myself is, well, do I just short it right now? You know, that's where every day I'll look at, I'll look at my, my bias, my opinion, and I'll say, okay, it's moving lower, but where's going to be the best and most opportune from a risk reward standpoint place for me to get short the Euro. And like I've been saying the last two days, Hey, if you can get any move back up to 117, you know, and, and, and uh, you're still looking at my charts here. So, you, you, you know, if you get, a, you get a move back up to 117, that's going to be an, a good opportunity to be on the short side of the Euro dollar. Just like last night, um, the analysis says on Forex analytics, the Euro dollar should find sellers at the 117 level, the support near 11650. So last night, you know, Blake, when you're on this, while you're on that page, um, yeah. you know, I love the community that we have. I'm a big believer in communities, but I think one thing that is different about us is that if you wanted to find Elliott wave analysis, you'd probably subscribe to a guy who that's his methodology. And then if you wanted harmonics, you'd probably uh, have another subscription to someone who specializes in harmonics. And if you were conventional or candlestick, what we have done is we've brought all these different methodologies together. And then you have this uh, traffic light page that I have a lot of conviction when a few different methodologies are pointing towards the same outcome. And to be able to have at my fingertips, Greg's work, Andre's work, the whole team's work um, that come from different disciplines, I think is an edge. And yeah. I just wanted to bring that up too. No, and that's a great point. I mean, you, you know, here, here's, here, this is the Elliott Wave analysis from, in, from European trade today. And uh, Greg was saying, you know, uh, the C pivot on an Elliott wave analysis is gonna be at 116.20. Do you know what the low is right now in the Euro? 116.12. We basically completed his pattern and he thinks- Clean it up, Greg. But, <laughs> but if you think about that for a moment and you're like, okay, well, Blake's targeting 116 intraday, you know, then I have uh, the Elliott wave analysis points to 116.20 you know, maybe even a little bit lower. He, he has it a little bit lower than that. Wave four completes just probably at 116. Then that's telling you, for me, it would be telling me, hey, I don't, I don't think I really want to be short the euro down here. If I, if I know that support is going to be around 116 and I have Elliott waves completing at those levels. And that's like the, the this is where the, the power of multiple types of analysis really comes into play. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully you guys can take advantage of that. And, yeah. and, I, and, and it's I, and not I just Elliot Wave, it's Greg Horvat, who true. when I was on uh, uh, FX Street, won an award every year. That's how I got to know him because I had to interview the FX Street award winners. Correct, and you can you can you know learn about all of our team here. We we've, we've hand selected obviously the, the these folks that are associated with us, which is you know it's been it's been a wonderful it's been wonderful. So for those of you guys that want to take advantage of it, let me just uh, again as as the main one of the main sponsors of uh, Trader Summit, uh, we do have a seasonal offer, and a seasonal offer we only offer this a couple times a year. Um, it is coinciding with the Trader Summit. We, we started offering it a couple of weeks ago. So uh, if you want to take advantage of our seasonal offer, it's the best pricing you're going to find uh, throughout the course of the year. So uh, make sure you do so. Now, let me, let me stop uh, one uh, minute. Um, be, before We got about 10 minutes before we're going to take our first break and get ready for Danielle DiMartino Booth. Um, which I'm excited to, uh, to interview, by the way. Uh, the reason why I'm so excited to interview her is because, uh, A, I feel like I wish I would have found her 
like years ago. She's a wealth of knowledge and, you know, being able to talk to somebody who's been inside the Fed is, I think, extremely valuable. So the questions that I have are going to be, you know, very relevant for, for, for what's happening in today's market. And uh, it's going to be really great to get her viewpoint. But we got about 10 minutes before uh, we, we do that. But I want to talk a little bit about the Traders Summit and uh, the rest of the, the conference that's happening this weekend and what's to come. Uh, Traders Summit has, uh, has, has really grown more of a life of its own as well. And one of the things about the Traders Summit that you will realize in the next in the next few weeks is this is just the beginning. We will have a, a, a destination for all of you, a place for you guys to go to get analysis, opinions about not only, not just currency markets, I think currency markets will be a smaller subset of the entire market. And we're gonna have contributors from all over the globe from, you know, that, 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 that are professionals in the field that Dale has interviewed and we have interviewed as a, as a company for many, many years, you're going to see a lot of familiar faces on the Traders Summit as, as sharing ideas each and every day. It's not going to be just every few months. We're going to have a daily, every day you're going to see constant analysis and it's all going to be free for you guys. So it's really exciting that um, Trader Summit is developing to that because, as you've seen that the you know this this weekend, the lineup of speakers that you see here, like I said, is just the beginning, and we have a lot of uh, different uh, traders and investors and professionals in the community that will be offering up their opinions, and it'll be a place for everybody to you know to 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 go and visit and um, you know, see different outlooks and understand different outlooks about the market. Uh, Steve Stelios, uh, would you like to mention anything more about the Trader Summit as I'm mentioning it right now? Um, the, the only, uh, I think you covered everything. The only addition is that um, it's also gonna have a lot of uh, video content, be it uh, either uh, some of the people recording a, a short video about an opinion instead of just writing an article and uh, short up to the point like five ten minute interviews so right. it, it's it's going to be um you know very easy to track and to follow um you know um it's not going to be long interviews that you need to plan for the week ahead uh, you know some day to watch them as i said up to the point something happened we had a fed announcement a couple of people are going to answer two three questions and post them online right actionable so it's gonna... actionable analysis Yes, and, you know, and that was the point. And, yeah. and Dale, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. One of the things that we do every day is, uh, with, especially with our face webinars, um, you know, that, that obviously we don't do them all day long. We do, we, it's an hour and a half every morning. Um, we, we try to bring you guys actionable ideas. Like, what, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, what's happening in currencies and what's happening in the S&P and where's a good pivot point, where's an area that it might find some, you know, support or resistance based off this type of analysis and why. And having that type of analysis in individual stocks, having it in you know different marketplace, uh, di different markets, different indices, uh, you know whether it's you know precious metals or you're looking at the the ten year and you're looking at you know the, the yield curve, having that type of analysis throughout the course of the uh, the the um, uh, day and having it refreshed constantly. I think is going to be very valuable to the individual trader. So, um, so guys, I, I just want to wrap up with saying that I, I'm really excited for this week, and I, and I appreciate you all listening in um, and kind of understanding, you know, the, the beginnings of Forex Analytics, but also understanding where where uh, where Trader Summit is going in the future. And I'm really excited about all of these different interviews and presentations you're going to have for the next couple of days. And remember, if you have to step away. Uh, and, and you're not around for one interview, um, we're going to have recordings, right, Steve? Absolutely right. And, and we're going to um, edit them, upload them as fast as possible, and we're going to mail um, every person that has registered so they know exactly where to find them and when. Very good. And, and 
you know, the, those people that were at the last Trader Summit know that uh, it was a really successful event. Uh, yeah, it was at the beginning of COVID during the lockdown, but but being able to go back and 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 watch some of those interviews and some of the important uh, points that that, uh, that that people have made, um, you know, it's it's extremely valuable, and 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 you you can feel good about knowing that that if you do miss one, um, you're going to be able to visit those recordings. So uh, let me ask you guys this. What are you most looking forward to over the next three days personally? Well, me, uh, I, let's I with, could, Hey, let's yeah. start with Stelios. Yeah, Go yeah. Ahead. Why not? The youngest. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I've told you guys before when I first, uh, well, I was a computer scientist that changed career. I became a market maker in interest rates, derivatives, and the first books that my boss on day one gave me to read was one about bonds and futures, whatever. The other one was Market Wizards. So I really, really want to hear uh, Jack Schwager and, uh, and Peter Schiff. I mean, everybody is amazing, but uh, Jack Schwager, I have a soft spot for, I must say. That's going to be, that's going to be the number one for you, huh? Awesome. Uh, how about you, Steve? Uh, you know, I have a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of interviews I'm looking forward to, but you know, I can't lie. I'm really looking forward to the debate. I, I think it's going to be explosive. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. To the the having <laughs> this panel, excuse me, we have, uh, and I know I know our team worked really hard to try to get different viewpoints. It's one thing that if you have a debate panel and you got everybody going, oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm all. I'm bullish gold. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. You know, but having different <laughs> opinions and knowing that, knowing that their opinions, not only on, on certain asset classes, but monetary policy might completely be on two different ends of the spectrum. It's going to be a wonderful to debate to watch tomorrow. I yes. Think. And there are several points of contention. Um, you know, uh, I, I think all of them will be interesting to, um, you know, to see because we know that several of the people there have different opinions for several asset classes, but not only, not only that, some fundamental differences as well, where they think the economy is headed, where they think um, monetary policy is headed, if they think it's good or bad. Um, so I, I think, especially having... Um, uh, you know, Abigail uh, doing the moderating. She's, for those that don't know, Ab Abigail Doolittle, she's a Bloomberg um, host. Anchor. Hostess, yeah. actually, yes. Um, so I, I think uh, we're going to get the best out of it. And, and, and by the way, before she was with Bloomberg, I mean, she was on Twitter. She's the Chartress. And, uh, and I, I think we followed each other probably for six, seven, eight years or so. I, I've, I've never talked to her one-on-one. -on -one. I know Joe's, Joe uh, from our team, uh, Joe Perry, he, he especially pre-COVID, he used to go into the, the Bloomberg studios and, and film the chart trading, no, futures trade, charting futures, her, her, her show. Um, and I know he's had an opportunity to meet her a lot uh, or many, uh, many different occasions, which is, uh, which is cool, but I'm 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 excited to to hear because she has an opinion. She's not just a she's just not a moderator. She has an opinion. Absolutely. Um, yeah, she Dale, has been on a trading floor. She she does know. How about you, Dale? What are you What are you looking forward to? Well, you know what I I think the biggest thing for me is going to be after the event and hearing from the attendees and viewers of what they learned. Uh, that's a key is that uh, maybe there was one idea, uh, just like, you know, Blake, uh, I've talked to people that you've mentored and your teachings, they, they'll come out and say it was life changing. So I'm looking for the life changing moments for traders here this weekend, something they didn't know that their eyes are open to that could change things for the better for them. Well said. Okay. So for me, let me, let me tell you for me. I'm looking forward to it all, but there's one guy that I just recently started following because of this event and I had no, I, I didn't know he even existed. Uh, and then I'm like, Oh, I've seen him on other forums and I've, and, and then I'm like, Oh, I put two and two together is Michael Guyad. He's a, he's, he, oh, yeah. he's, he's one of our sponsors um, for Toroso investments. Uh, so he's an active manager, um, which is cool, I've interviewed but, Michael before. 
Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've, and I've never, you know, for me, when you do the yeah. interviews, I try yeah. to catch them after the fact, but usually I, I roll off to go trade uh, yeah. for the day. So I miss a lot of your interviews and I know yeah. you've interviewed them. And I just started following him on Twitter, you know, a few weeks ago. And then I really started to focus in on his ideas and what he's sharing. And I'm like, man, this guy's brilliant. I, I can't wait to, I actually can't wait to, to, to hear what he has to say about the market. So um, that for me is like something that's kind of new and exciting for me. It's like a rock concert, Blake. It is. It's like Woodstock of FX. That's what yeah. we have going here. All right. <laughs> can, well, speaking can, of which, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that everybody gets a restroom break uh, before our interview with Daniel DiMartino Booth. I'm super excited to actually interview her, um, and that's gonna come up in just a few minutes. Steve, did you want to take over the screen uh, uh, to put everybody on break, or how do you want to do that? Uh, absolutely, mate. Unless, of course, uh, Stelius and. Uh, Dale want to cover something. Uh, so it's, I just, it's I just wanted to, uh, to say one last thing, and that was from a question from our friend Alexander. He said, Blake, do you actually look at others' uh, analysis before you trade? And I want to say that this is something I do. I'm a macro trader, and I always, because I'm known to be early <laughs> in trading, uh, I always look at uh, what you say, what Gregor says. I try to find the, the best entry and exit positions uh, or levels based on your analysis. So I learn every day from being together with people like that. So, uh, and, you know. and you know, that's a, that's a great answer. And I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to leave it with this because I think it's such a great question. I do. I actually look at what other people have to say if I know who they are and I respect their analysis. So um, I, I follow a few people on Twitter. I don't follow everybody. And I, I usually follow people when, if somebody says, Hey, follow this guy uh, because he has good analysis. Usually one of the guys from my, the, that are on my trading floor, uh, I will. But I, I usually, after a while, I can kind of figure out how this person approaches the market. And if I know their approach to a certain extent uh, and I respect their analysis, I'll look at it and I take that into consideration. And hopefully it's showing me something that I didn't see. And, and I, don't, I don't seek out confirmation from my own trades. I usually am looking for what would could go wrong with the trade that I'm seeing right now. You know, who's seeing opposite of what I'm seeing and why that's for me, the most important thing, because I like to, I plan my trade and then work my plan, you know, plan my trade, trade my plan. That that's, that's the way I like to approach the market, but there are going to be things wrong with what I'm doing. And there's going to be things that could derail what I'm trying to accomplish in the market and the trade I'm trying to make. So I'll take in, like, I know a lot of people look at my analysis and they're like, they, they, a lot of them probably trade counter to way I trade. I might say there's big support here. So be careful being short. They might go, Hey, Blake's not wanting to be short here. I might look for a long to go counter that, you know, and I, I know there's people that do that because there's two sides of the market. I'm just not, I'm usually better on trading my bias in one direction. I'm not good at trading in both directions. I, I learned that about myself many, many years ago. So. Anyway, that was a great question though. All right, well guys, right, I'm going to step out for just a couple minutes and then uh, uh, I'll let you guys take over. I'll see you in about three minutes with Daniel DiMartino Booth. Yeah, see, she's already on from what I see, Blake. Perfect. Dale? Yes. Yeah, hi, Steve. Hi. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, yes uh, there, there's Danielle. I've had the pleasure of interviewing Danielle once before on Face. Great to see you back, Danielle. Hi there. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to this interview that you have with Blake. And uh, gosh, what a, a period that we're looking for. When I talked to you, uh, I couldn't have imagined uh, what we have happening here in our world. We've really crossed into a new paradigm, haven't we? We have. It's just more of the old paradigm. Okay, right. Uh, on steroids? Absolutely, yes. Okay, all right. So I'm going to save the questions for for Blake, but I want to thank you for uh, a, being part of our summit. And I'm a fan, and it's great to have uh, people that, uh, you know, don't hedge. When they have something to say, you say it. And you mean it, and it's uh, with conviction. So looking forward to your interview with Blake Morrow. Thank you.
Thank you for being with us. Blake is going to be here in, in a minute. Great. Dale, it's not a crime. You can ask a question. <laughs> oh, no, not a crime? <laughs> All right. All right. Is Paul out of bullets, Danielle? Uh, it's Paul's out of bullets for the moment. Okay. He's out of bullets Cause, for the moment. Yeah, because he's really trying to jawbone uh, having some fiscal action take place to support what the Fed is doing and uh, looks like they're finally going to come up with some kind of compromise. Do you think that they'll be able to put something together before the election, a relief package? I, you know, it's hard to say. I, I haven't, I, I, I had an interview in, um, I had a keynote in Switzerland a little while ago, so I have not followed the headlines. Have they come up with a deal? They're talking about a compromise now. Oh, so she's, so the, the Democrats are no longer at the 2.4 trillion. I, you know, I, they're talking compromise. I'm not sure uh, what uh, it's going to be, but but Blake, but Blake is here, and it's great to see you, Danielle. And I'm looking forward to hearing your interview with uh, one of the best traders I know, Blake Morrow. Well, thank you, Dale, and hello, Danielle. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. You know what's? I, I got to tell you something that's a little. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, I knew we were going to be matching today. Yeah, <laughs> I one of our one of our traders who is in our um, he's, he's in our community and I actually had a question for you a little bit later that I might spring on you. He's like he's like I'm watching Danielle right now online uh, doing this event and he's like oh wow she books some pretty close and I'm like oh wow look we're going to be matching today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a Switzerland. That was actually a charitable event. They were ra raising money uh, for Lebanon. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for being part of the Trader Summit. Uh, we really appreciate you being here to kick off the event. And I couldn't think of a better person to have here. And I've seen you on TV multiple times. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little upset that I hadn't followed you on Twitter sooner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I was going to do is I was actually going to, I was going to send you a succulent so we could do a between the two ferns like you did with, uh, with <laughs> Jeffrey <Gunn. Google. laughs> I was like, I was like, Hey, can you hold up the succulent and we could be between two ferns. I thought that was a great uh, interview, by the way. I'm a big Jeffrey Gumlock fan. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, um, I'm delighted that they follow my work as closely as they do. Uh, but that was my first flight post COVID was out to Los Angeles and I walked into the studio and I went, you gotta be kidding me. This is way too cliche. So I'm looking at these <laughs> two plans and I'm like, Oh, here we are. You, you know, here, when you said that, I actually was, I was, um, I was uh, watching the interview in a, in a car at my son's uh, soccer practice and I about fell out of my chair. It was the, it was the <laughs> anyway. Uh, but once again, I want to I want to thank you. I, I know I know the time's limited here, and um, to have you here is uh, I think extremely valuable to the trading community. Uh, we are a community of traders and investors, um, so we might have a little bit different approach to to um, you know your opinions than maybe some other groups um, because we're you know, looking, always looking for insights and to have somebody who's been, been on the inside of the Fed, I think is extremely valuable. So uh, I, I wanted to really start off to asking you how you got your start at the Dallas Fed. Well, so um, it, I'll make a long story short. I always knew that I wanted to become a writer and I'm actually now a writer. We publish every day and every week. Um, so after the market closed, when I lived in New York, I was at DLJ at the time before it got bought up by Credit Suisse, I would run up to Columbia and I got my second master's in journalism as a night student when I was working full time on Wall Street. So um, when 9-11 happened and the buildings came down, you know, I'm long distance dating this guy back and forth from Dallas to New York, which was an adventure, uh, but uh, it, it was getting old. And so I I sold my book of business back to the Drexel boys. Uh, it, I, I was mostly into uh, trading junk at that point, signed a non-compete, agreed to leave the industry and moved to Dallas, told the publisher of the Dallas Morning News that I would work for free. He said that that worked really well with his budget. And within a few months, I've got my own column about the markets. I'm writing about mortgage equity withdrawal. I'm good friends with Jan Hatzius at Goldman Sachs. And 
I'm predicting that the housing market's going to crash. I was the only person on public record who said that it would be global and systemic in nature. And it was because we know that the subprime bomb went off in something called a Landis Bank in Germany that I'd never heard of. That's systemic risk. It's when risk pops up and you're like, what's that? So you don't know where it's going to occur. Anyways, about 12 minutes in or so, Warren E. Buffett reached out and I'm like, spam. But I opened it anyways because I'm like, I wonder what E stands for. It actually was from Warren E. Buffett himself. He's like, I really like what you write. Come on out to Omaha. And I'm like, well, I've got a five month old. And he's like, we can do baby press passes. Just bring him. So I did. Uh, and so I went out to Omaha. I met Charlie Munger, who had a great influence on how I think about investing. And six months later or so, Richard Fisher came calling. And wow. he's, like, he's like, you should be working at the Wall Street Journal. You should be working at The Economist. You're wasting your life away. And I'm like, or I'm barefoot and pregnant and I've signed a non-compete. I've left Wall Street and I'm really happy. So um, in any event, uh, he asked me to serve the country. I ended up doing so for nine years throughout the financial crisis. Uh, I was, he had a very unorthodox p position for me. Um, all Federal Reserve districts are bound to take their markets intelligence from the New York markets desk. It's, it's written down. Okay. Uh, it, it reads like sell side research. And Richard and I both had our MBAs in finance. Richard and I both started off on Wall Street in New York and we knew the value of sell side research, dot, dot, dot. So he started his own markets desk inside the Dallas Fed. So wow. before every FOMC meeting, I would travel to New York and I'd hit the trading desks and I'd speak to the economist. I'd talk to people on the buy side, go to Lions Burstein, check in with everybody and prepare a markets briefing. And that markets briefing, he would take into the FOMC meetings. Geithner and Dudley subsequently could not stand me because I'm speaking to the same people that their markets desk are speaking to, but I'm coming up with completely different conclusions that actually have to do with reality on planet Earth as opposed to the sell side research that they put out. Thank you, Mr. Former Goldman Sachs. And I, I, I got underneath their skin, but I, I'm proud to say that Powell used to read my research. And when I left the Fed, the minute that Richard walked out the door, I walked out the door. I'm not a good bureaucrat. I don't do sensitivity training. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, so uh, when, when he left, I left. We ran into each other at a football game. And he said, listen, Danielle, there's one person on the committee, only one person on the committee who I want for you to pay attention to. This is fall 2015. And I said, who's that? And he said, Jay Powell. He said, remember, he's Republican. Obama got him in with Jeremy Stein, who was a Democrat. Sometimes if you want to get one candidate in, you bring two in, you do the kumbaya thing as opposed to, you know, hand to hand combat, which is what Trump has done with his Fed nominees in, in, in the Senate. So I said, fine, I'll pay attention to this Jay Powell person. He's like, he's the only person who wants to shrink the balance sheet. He's the only person who wants to normalize interest rates. So follow him closely. And I'm like, he's quiet as a mouse. He doesn't say anything. He's like, that's the point, Danielle. Less is more. Follow him. And then years later, there he was, Fed chair. So that's, that's, my, that's my short story long, sorry. Wow, no, that's an amazing story because I was going to ask, you know, what was your experience like? But it sounds like you were an insider, an outsider insider. <laughs> I was not liked at the Fed. I asked for a live CNBC feed and they're like, what? And I'm like, the market's open, people. And these PhDs would go to the executive dining room like at 11 o'clock and come back at one and regurgitate their dissertation. And I'm like, and you'll wonder what's wrong with monetary policy. Look at you people. So <laughs> no, I was not popular. I'm not, I'm not on any Christmas card list at the Fed, none. That is so, that's funny, but it's awesome to hear. And uh, you know, I was, I, was I, I lived actually in Dallas for 13 years from 99 to 2012 before we moved back to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona to raise our kids around the family. You know, Technology has allowed traders to kind of do that around, sure. around town. You know, um, but, uh, I, and I love Dallas, by the way. So, but I wanted to ask you, what was your biggest, what do you think it was your biggest takeaway from working at the Fed? Because it sounds like to me, you know, that they just, they, they, it's hard for everybody to get things done. It, it was. Productivity was something that they wrote about in theory, but that they had no understanding of in practice. They were the least productive people. Um, you know, I, I, I'm like a poster child for Ritalin. They tried to give me the first generation of it when I was like three and a half. I'm clinically hyperactive, OCD, ADHD, all those things. Never taken any of that stuff, which explains me. Um, but it takes a lot to slow me down to write a book. 
I, we, we publish daily. We publish for institutional investors every day. And I'm really good at news flow. I'm really bad at spending two and a half years of my life writing a book um, that had to be footnoted. But that's how angry I got in 2010 when at the conclusion of a year long study, the Fed said, you know what? This inflation metric, it's led us down the wrong path, not once, but twice, and it needs to be replaced. And I'm like, you think so? You think asset inflation is meaningful? Okay, just so we're on the same page here. And after a lot of introspection and, and soul searching, they decided to do absolutely nothing about it. So they kept it. So really? Stanley, Fisher's, Stanley Fisher's first FOMC me me meeting when he was vice chair, raised his hand, stood up and said, why don't you use headline CPI? like the rest of the world and then you know and, and and why don't you incorporate asset anyways so some fed staffer raised his hand this is in the book raised his hand and said sir if we didn't use the core pc our models will break and so jim bullard in one of his only humorous moments as opposed to yesterday we're going to be out of this by the end of the year uh but jim bullard raises his hand and he said let me get this straight this is how we make monetary policy crap in crap out and that's how they do it to this day Wow. And so hence came the book, uh, Fed Up. Yes. <laughs> hence came the book, well, Fed Up. And, you know, you said something interesting about Jay Powell um, when you were telling us about how you kind of got to where you're at. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask, because I think he was on the right path or he was on the path that you had talked about. Right. He wanted to normalize uh, policy. He wanted to raise interest rates. Um, he was almost there and then COVID happened. So No, no, no you're, you're wrong. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. I, I promise I'll make this really quick. Remember, okay. his first day in office, the Dow Jones was like down over a thousand points. His first day in office, February the 5th, 2018, Volmageddon was erupting. And he right. said nothing, nothing. His first congressional testimony, he said, not my job to backstop the stock market. Not my job. Thank you. Look elsewhere. <clears throat> Halloween, GE's credit gets downgraded. 14 days later, junk bond issuance freezes for 41 record days. And the IMF and the BIS and all the, they're like, uh, excuse me, we've got a spread problem here and we've got massive redemptions coming out of these exchange traded high yield funds and the, the collateral backing them is trading by appointment only. And Jay Powell had to back off. So on January the 4th, he's up on stage with Bernanke and Yellen. He stands up in front of me. I mean, I was getting condolence cards in the mail. It was, I, I'm crying, I'm bawling. And he's like, I'm sorry when I was in, I was a rookie in 2012. I apologize for criticizing QE. It works. Wow. And that was the Powell pivot. And he never looked back since. Never looked back since. Neither of markets. So COVID was just a bump in the road. COVID was like the catalyst. But what set off the leverage bomb occurred on Halloween 2018 when GE's debt got downgraded and was trading like junk overnight. And then they're like, oh God, we've doubled leverage in the space of a decade and it's problematic. And that's so you know what I, where we are today. You know what I love about you, Danielle, is you really understand the markets and behavior of the markets, not just the Fed and their actions. You understand how it really impacts the markets. Um, you know, and so does Jay Powell, by the way. I'm sorry? So does Jay Powell. Uh, <laughs> hence Look, he's quiet. He, he, he was in private equity. He, he founded the industrials group at, at the Carlisle. He's worth over $100 million. He thinks he's serving his country and he speaks to all these guys, hedge fund manager. He understands the credit markets. So when you, when you talk about like taking a step back about COVID since it's just a bump, so you say, how do you think the, their response has been to the COVID situation and all these loan facilities that they've created, all these you know, acronyms that I forgot them all already. And um, do you think they're going to even do more moving forward? Or can they? Now, this is, now, now, A, it was clear that, that a doomsday policy was in place after what happened with junk bond issuance freezing. Okay. Um, Neiman Marcus in May of 2019, Neiman Marcus issued some debt and the bond market froze for seven days. And Powell actually started making rumblings about negative interest rates and the possibility thereof, and then markets corrected themselves again. So the Fed had in place the doomsday scenario. So what was deployed was deployed with, with purpose and design. And we knew going into 2020, because 
Gunlack and I, uh, we, we asked Merrill, we asked Morgan Stanley to redo some math that they had done earlier on in the year that said 39% of triple B rated bonds would, would be junk if the credit rating agencies were doing their job. So they, Morgan Stanley redid the math for us in December and that 39% had gone up to 42%. Wow. So going into the year, Powell knew that triple B was an accident waiting to happen. So that's why you had the very explicit grandfathering in from March the 22nd on of any fallen angels. Any debt that had been downgraded was eligible for Fed purchases. Wow. So it negated the Ford effect. It negated all of the downgrade effect because you investors, even though they knew it was junk, had to treat it like investment grade because the Fed backstopped it explicitly in the special purpose vehicle. And that is what stopped the bloodletting. Go into the zero bound, unlimited QE, blah, blah, blah. All that was just, that, that was already planned and ready to go. The problem today is the market's beginning to lose confidence. Jay Powell cannot print jobs. Jay Powell cannot print cash flow. These are two things he can't do. He cannot stop the bankruptcies from happening because he can't print cash flow. So, and he, he does not like Donald Trump at all. Remember, he's a card-carrying Republican. Most people would not describe Donald Trump as a card-carrying Republican since he signed socialism into law. So um, you, you have to appreciate that he will not buy stocks with 39 days until an election. Because you can tell some Joe walking down Fifth Avenue that the Fed is buying junk bonds and their eyeballs are gonna roll into the back of their head and they'll be like, huh? You know, you know junk bonds, more expensive than stocks. It's riskier than equities for God's sake. He's gone further than the Swiss. And they'll be like, huh? You stop the same Joe or Jane on Fifth Avenue and you're like, the Fed's buying the stock market. <gasps> That's an American. They can't do that. That's a big no-no. So. It's a, it, it, optically and narratively, it's a lot easier to explain and a lot more damning. So if markets fall out of bed before election day, I don't think that the Fed comes in and buys stock, even though the fine print of the BlackRock agreement already stipulates that the special purpose vehicle is standing ready, public, public matter. So what so, does Jay Powell do? I don't, you know, does he do, he does nothing. He's not gonna do negative interest rates. The whole banking system would collapse. You can't do negative interest rates. Other countries can do negative interest rates, but your, your, your discount models, your Black-Scholes models, they plug in our positive interest rates so their models work. But somebody has to have a reference risk-free rate. You know, uh, I, was, I was listening to Fed Chairman Powell yesterday and some of the comments that he said yesterday, and he said downside risk uh, could well be out there without further aid. And he's, it sounds like the Fed is begging, begging Congress to do something at this point. Well, they, they know that they're worried about the efficacy of QE, but they still know that it's got an 82% correlation with the growth of the S&P. The growth of the Fed's balance sheet has an 82% correlation with the S&P 500 since 2009. That is the only thing that they know that works in their tool shed to try and hold the market together is so if the treasury has to issue a bunch more debt, then they're like, awesome, we'll buy it. So they're begging for stimulus. Wow. They want and any product. So last, so last week, you know, uh, Fed Chairman Powell said that, uh, that he, he said, quote, I wouldn't say we're out of ammo, but what if he said we are out of ammo or we he have- did say we're, he, he did say it, didn't he? Yeah. I, say, I mean, that, sorry, but that's Freud channeling himself right through Powell's mouth. Uh, yeah. but they need product. They need paper. I see. It, you know, it's, it's real. you know, I was going to ask you actually a little bit uh, later, I was going to ask you if you think that the, that the fed is influenced by the, the president. And I think I got my answer from you. Well, I mean, what, what do you, what do you think? No, in fact, I, I think the one thing that grates on him the most, and these are the whack jobs on my Twitter feed in the middle of the night who are like, He's just a crazy Trumpian. And I'm like, no, he's not. He's not. He's, he's afraid of the credit markets. And he could give a flip about trying to support Donald Trump. So it, it is the biggest misconception on Wall Street is that he's doing something. Now, I, I will say, though, the caveat is Mnuchin and Powell speak the same language. So what the Fed is doing is against the law. 
And I think that future generations of politicians, we forget that in World War II, when there was yield curve control and they capped the 10 year yield, that in 1951, they, uh, they had to cut the, the, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury had to be severed. The Monetary Treasury Policy Accord of 1951 by William McChesney Martin, who said, you've got to take the punch bowl away just when the party's getting started. He went on to become the longest serving Fed chair in history after he helped that accord push through. But future politicians are going to have to re-separate the treasury from the Fed because the 1913 act dictates that it be apolitical and independent. I see. Well, um, can, can I ask you this? Um, you're going back to like the Fed and, and what they have in their toolbox. I've always believed, and, and you know, you hear, you hear the Fed uh, talk about, that it's mostly rhetoric, right? The rhetoric, in my opinion, is going to be Fed Chairman Powell's, one of his biggest tools that he's got in his toolbox, right? And, I mean, we, we, we look at, like, I remember the Greenspan days, and you look at the, uh, you know, the briefcase indicator. The briefcase field. indicator. Right, yeah. the old briefcase indicator, you're like, oh, my God, he's holding so much papers. I think he just filled his... Oh, he, he's on the record in, on, on, on 60 Minutes saying he liked to jack with investors. Right. So, but what happens, because you kind of alluded to it, what happens if the investing public loses confidence in the Federal Reserve? And are we already starting to see some of that right now? You are, right? Because he, you know, he, he blows it in Jackson Hole, August the 27th. Yeah. We're going to do this we're gonna do average inflation and the whole world is like, oh, it's a regime change at the Fed. And I'm like, it's a bunch of bullshit. So, and then they come out the next week, a few days later with the FOMC statement and all the way out to 2023, they see the, the, the PCA targeted at 1.7%. So the market went, wait a minute, wait a minute. And behind closed doors no, and investors, investors chased them behind closed doors. The Fed had started before this rhetoric, before this major shift change, the Fed had been hoovering up tips, like buying all the treasury inflation protected securities it could, and the market's like, oh, negative real yields, and the dollar is going to hell in a handbasket, and the crazies are out in the middle of the night on my Twitter feed going, the reserve currency status is going away tomorrow, buy gold, Bitcoin now. And, but but they're, they're, the Fed is actually buying tips. The Fed is creating the narrative and this idea that inflation is bubbling up while you've got a, you know, 26 million people yesterday collecting unemployment benefits in the country, which is deflationary. This is economics 101. And that's his biggest problem is that he's trying to talk inflation up when it's deflation knocking on the door. Well, you, and, and again, we go back to the rhetoric, right? And I was going to ask you, because uh, I, from what I've seen of you, I, I, I already assumed that you were more seeing deflation near term, which I agree with. And I'm 100% in agreement with what you're saying. Come down. Rents coming down a third. Rents, housing is the biggest input into, into every inflation metric. And you're seeing rents come down. They've got to be shaking in their shoes at the Fed. So, okay, the, the Fed, and you kind, of, you kind of talked a little bit about this too. The Fed, tell me how they, they, they gauge inflation. And it, I know it's not right. I mean, as, a, as, a, as just, you know, just a consumer, you know, we, we see the inflation. We know it's there. The Fed doesn't see it. But are they hiding behind that? I mean, how? It, how? It, look, it, it is, again, remember, I, why I spent two and a half years writing a book because yeah. they have to hide behind it. They know that, uh, they know that our health insurance inflation is not Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates. They know that. They know we're spending a lot more on healthcare insurance and yet they keep it in there. They know we're spending more on housing and yet it's also understated, the two biggest line items in a household budget. And they net out oil and food, So, but, but they have to have the broken metric because they have to hide something to hide behind to, in order to justify the constant QE. So then my, I guess my next question would be, would they ever change it? But in, in, based on what you're saying, they, they, they shouldn't they or they won't. They can't. They're trapped. So they're trapped. I mean, look, look, look at how glacially slow quantitative tightening was. And the market throws, just loses its mind. They can't, they, they can't turn the facilities off. 
They can't stop the printing presses. They can't even flirt with, with exiting. And what they don't appreciate is that they're going to get the inflation. They are. If they decide to become Uncle Sam's printing press for hire and put MMT into policy and directly monetize the debt, guess what? We're going to have stagflation. You're going to watch bond investors say, this is what I think about your treasury. And I'm going to demand more. If you're going to take it from 30 to $60 trillion, if you think you can get away with that, you're going to have to pay up. Without the growth, you go from deflation to stagflation. Wow. That, that, and that would be something, because, you know, we look at our bond markets, they don't move. They've like, they're completely stagnant. <laughs> and I'm waiting for the, what is the breaking point that's going to really push yields one direction or the other, really. And right. that's, that, you know, as a trader, that's what we're all waiting for. Um, and you make a great point. I mean, you know, as, as, a, as a consumer, you live in Dallas. I, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, probably two very hot real estate markets. Yeah. And I don't understand. As they consumers, we don't hot. understand. Jay Powell okay. has created the housing boom. He, it's, it's his baby. Because housing's the most leading of all sectors. So what does he do? He buys up a trillion dollars of mortgage-backed securities in five minutes. And you've, you know, you've got a 30-year quoted at 1.99%. And you've got FHA lending. My, I've got a Bloomberg column out on the terminal today. It's on the web. But I, I, had, I, I walked through the math with a guy by the name of Ed Pinto at AEI, who was Fannie's former uh, chief economist. And he walked me through the math. Americans have taken $100 billion out of their homes in six months. Cash out refinancing is quite, quite hot right now. And you've got Fannie and Freddie both using automated appraisals to do these cash out refinancings. They're not even looking at the house. So the Fed is engineering this narrative that there's this great pocket of strength in the market because you've got this exodus from the suburbs. That's organic, fundamental, and real. Yeah. You've got wealthy people who are renting homes in the Hamptons for $75,000 a month in the winter. So that part is real. People of means really are buying in the suburbs. Vail, Aspen, their prices have gone through the roof, but these are people of means. But FHA lending is still three and a half percent down. So it's, you, you remember accounting from school, right? Last in, first yeah. out. The, the, if you think we've got riots in our streets today, wait until the people who are upside down when, when, when forbearance for 12 months expires in, in March, wait until they realize they're upside down in their houses and get foreclosed on. You have 7% of the mortgage market in forbearance. Right, right. You have a foreclosure moratorium. You have 15% FHA delinquency rates, the highest in records back to 1979. So once banks can start to, to move on this, people are going to realize that they asininely bought in at the top of the market, of the housing market. But this is created by the Fed. So that brings me to another uh, subject as far as from an investing standpoint. Um, I, my assumption would be that you are probably bullish precious metals and uh, maybe like you gold. Know, gold, silver. Uh, how do you feel about precious metals and what's going to continue to drive those prices higher? Well, so right now investors are, they're, they're going off of the traditional textbook that says, okay, if the Fed's full of it and there is no inflation, then why am I holding gold? And so, in, so you've seen that step back. And we're also seeing a miniature repeat of what we saw in March and in April with people going, I've got margin calls, my portfolio's all over the damn map, but at least I've got value, so I'm gonna sell my gold. So you've got two different dynamics going on right now. But if you look back through history, gold is outperformed in inflationary and deflationary times as long as there's disruption in the markets. So I'm holding steady on my gold because I think that there's disruption in the markets and right. more to come with a potentially contested election and volatility out into November, really, really expensive. What's not expensive is, is, is the move. So if you're looking for protection and you don't want to buy equity puts, buy, 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 buy the move. Got it. Okay. I, I try to protect them. Do you feel do you feel the same about cryptocurrencies? Like, what's your opinion on cryptocurrencies? I'm I'm and and I'm going to tell you personally, I just don't know enough about it. But I know I know the trading community at large is 
a fan of cryptocurrencies has made you maybe a, a different type of hedge. Um, how do you how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, it's kind of like it's like it's like TikTok for it's you know instead of whatever we had when we were you know I'm much older than you, but the Walkman, you know, it's 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 like that. You I know, have... people who remember what the Walkman is, they own yeah. gold, and people who want to make a name for themselves and they own Bitcoin because it's hip, it's happening, it's like the new gold, it's a place to be. I mean, I was part of the Bitcoin scam on Twitter, so Bitcoin can put it where the sun doesn't shine. So anything that, that's as penetrable and you can get in there and jack with it and it can be part of crime and all this other stuff. Now, I'll, I'll possibly have a different opinion about it if we go over the line into quantum and it becomes a lot more economical to manufacture this thing because mining is not economical. Um, but really Bitcoin is, is it, it's a reflection of people's disgust with fiat currency and you know, the Fed trying to cut, the, you know, cut your dollar in half in 50 years time. Right. So, uh, but I own gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, know, I know we only have a, probably about 15 minutes left. I, I did wanna ask you though, um, we, a, lot of, a lot of people in our community look at what the Fed's doing and expanding the balance sheet. And we see other central banks are obviously um, matching that as well. $1.5 billion dollars every hour. That, how, say again? <laughs> $1.5 billion dollars per hour worldwide. That is crazy. So why, with, isn't, why don't we have a 40,000 Dow? Right, right, exactly. So asset price is going to continue to go higher. Maybe we continue to see a, I mean, everybody's looking at a V-shaped recovery. I see the K-shaped recovery. Am I crazy? Like, you know. Very K. I'm sorry? It's, it's very K. Okay. It's yeah. extremely K. Uh, okay. Because you've got, you've got, I mean, people are tired of hearing it, but small businesses still employed 47% of Americans right. prior to COVID. And they've been put out to dry. They've been completely left behind. And that's going to have long-term ramifications. It's going to take a lot of rebuilding efforts. There, there, there are going to be great innovations. Uh, I mean, I don't think I'll ever step into a pediatrician's office again as long as I live, unless the kid's bleeding. I mean, so COVID's going to create all kinds of new industries, and that's going to be wonderful. Uh, but in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding to be done. And I don't know that the K is permanent because... We're seeing Raymond James announce uh, 4% of its works, workforce is being laid off. We're seeing the country's largest law firms make uh, layoff announcements. So yeah. if you look on Indeed.com in the latest week, uh, job postings for lower income individuals are down by 12% year over year. Job postings for high income individuals are down 24% year over year. So the K is going to be in trouble if we continue to see this trickle up effect and white collar layoffs, which is a byproduct of demand destruction. It just right. takes a lot longer to move the pig through the Python. The initial people who lost their jobs were low income and the stimulus replaced it, right? We had the biggest increase in personal income in the history of mankind because of the extra $600 a week. So we've had retail sales really hang in there. But if you start to see white collar layoffs, then the K is in peril. That makes and a lot of sense. talking about a W. So, um, you know, I, I was, I was going to ask you, do you ever draw parallels between, and I don't know how much, um, uh, how, how much studying you've done on Japan and what the Bank of Japan has done over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Ever. Uh, forever, keeping the rates at zero. I know the demographics are different between the the U.S. and Japan. It's you can't even it's it's apples to oranges. But do you see any parallels between Japan's economy and the U.S. economy and how the BOJ has acted over the last 20, 30 years, and how the Fed is going to be moving forward? Um, yes and no. Um, the no is the fact that about a third of treasuries are owned by foreigners. Right. So the, the JGB market is fully domestic, owned internally. So oh, the post office. <laughs> yeah, owned by the, it is, it's owned by the post office, yes. Right, it is. <laughs> and, and the banks own 40% of CLOs. Right. And you know, Dan Fuss, the most intelligent, brilliant fixed income manager in the world is like, I'm not going there. So good luck, Japan. But um, so they, they're not, 
they're not beholden to the kindness of strangers. But we're not Japan in the sense that we don't have a long runway in front of us to start the printing presses because we've already pushed it so far. And we're not at the point where we can begin a recovery. So starting points matter. And it would be more convenient if we could be Japan because Japan has gone in and out of recession for years. There have been about five, re five recessions in Japan. They're in recession again, obviously. The whole world is in recession. But Japan has gone in and out of recession for years despite their monetary policy. And if you look at the price to earnings ratio, you can't buy multiple. And so the Bank of Japan has been pushing on a string. But nothing cataclysmic has happened to the Japanese economy other than, you know, they've, they've quit being the innovative country that's, gone to, that, that's now in, in China. So, um, and their no, demographics are a train wreck. But we're, we're, yeah. it's more likely, my good buddy, George Goncalves, uh, at Bond Strategist on Twitter, if you don't follow him, do. He's so smart. Um, but he sent, out, he sent out a poll a few weeks ago that said, are we in this scenario, this scenario? He and I both think that we're in great financial crisis 2.0 because of the credit, because of the credit situation wow. instead of Japan. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that, that is going to, that brings me actually to a question. This comes from um, uh, the, the gentleman uh, who's in our community that saw what you were wearing. He's like, you guys are going to be matchy. <laughs> His name's Leon. <laughs> And he said, this is a question for Danielle. He said, is there a way for the Fed to get out of the box it's painted itself into? ZERP forever, and they keep buying every increasing treasury debt. Or if not, what happens to the market on its own uh, starts raising rates or debasing the dollar index? From her book, Fed Up, and comments since she's not a fan of the Fed, so her thoughts on what the end game would look like uh, would be interesting. Thanks, and that's from Leon, one of our, one of our community members. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the trillion dollar question out there. Right. Can the Fed ever extricate itself? Can the Fed ever exit? And I think that the answer is, is you just look at what happened in 2018. And, you know, the Russell 2000 and the broader stock indices have not uh, ever gotten back to all time highs since 2018, when the Fed tried to begin extricating itself. So, I think it'll be very, very tenuous at best. Jay Powell in his, in his press conference used the words seven years. They did it for seven years last time and then and, and, and it didn't create a bubble. And I'm like, did he really just say that out loud? But, but I think that they think that they can do this for 10 years. I don't think the markets are going to allow it. I think that, I think that inflation will, I, I, bond vigilantes are not dead. They've just been hibernating for a really long time. I was going to say they are hibernating then. Because there's a lot of, and I'm not going to put, um, it, this is at the beginning of our, of our three-day event. And we have a lot of uh, fund managers and asset managers that are coming on the next couple of days. And I think, um, uh, and again, I'm not going to put their words into their mouths, but I know there's a few out there that are, that are like, the Fed can continue this much longer than we believe, um, which is obviously what, they want us to believe, but at, at some well, point, but as long as there's deflation, they'll continue that. But I mean, let's just say Biden wins. I'm not talking politics here, but let's just say Biden wins. Right. You know, when, when the debt ceiling was passed, it wasn't because Trump and Nancy decided to play nice in the sandbox. It was because the Democrats negotiated for there to be no ceiling on debt issuance through June of 2021. So you could have stimulus legislation passed the likes of which we've never seen between now and June. And, but again, at some point, I think that bond investors will hit their pain threshold. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's, again, the billion dollar question is when that's going to be. And I think we're all going to be waiting <laughs> for that. Um, you, you know, Dan Danielle, I, I actually have a couple of fun questions before I let you go, but I, I but but I, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to have you here. And and before I ask you these last two questions, how do people follow you? Because I just found you on Twitter. I, I, I'm actually going to be buying your book, and I'm now I'm a super fan of Danielle. So how do we Third follow subscribe to Quill Intelligence? There we go. Quillintelligence.com. 
So you write every day and you write we analysis? Every day. And okay. we put out investable ideas for our institutional clients. We publish a huge weekly thought piece. Macro investing is hot again, which is so awesome. I know. Make it data, macro great again. The data means something. It's like, wow, the data are relevant. Yay. So uh, <laughs> but we put out there, like you hear me speaking, is as I write. So it is unvarnished and it's the best research out there. And if you have insomnia, at Demartino Booth, follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm everywhere else, but I'm, I'm definitely the most active on Twitter. <laughs> Well, well, thank you so much for that. And like I said, I got a couple last questions. This one, one might be a fun one. Since you were an insider at the Fed, and you've, you've got to know, because we all as traders have this question, is the plunge protection team real at the Treasury? Um, you know, it is. And I, I, I know every tinfoil wearing hat out there is just like, see, I told you so. Um, but it's not inside the Fed. So uh, it, it is a, it's, it, and it involves more than just the treasury and the Fed. Yeah. So it's, it's a bigger, it's a bigger animal, but you know, you have to have like Lehman brothers, something along those lines, because we were limit stop down days right. after days, after days, after days, after days. And the PPT was not fired up, but that's because they had the doomsday scenario plan for the credit markets already ready to go on March 23rd. So there you go, guys. For those of you that need to put your tinfoil hat on, we're all gonna put it on soon as we're done with Danielle here. Uh, the last question for you. Um, you know, I, I know you'd mentioned that you just moved to Dallas and I, I was, you know, I, mo I moved there in 99 and I lived in uh, Uptown before Uptown was cool. So, cool, that is cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was fun. There. <laughs> yeah, but you know, my kids, we, we, we raised them in McKinney and you know, we moved north. Um, but it took me seven years to be a Dallas Cowboys fan. Oh, how about you? I was, uh, I was raised a Houston Oilers fan, oh, which geez. means that you grow up hating the Cowboys, and um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the Cowboys. Sorry, oh my I'm gosh, a huge fan of Longhorn football, though. And this there we is go. going to be our year. It is going to be our year. <laughs> well, Daniel, I, I really, really want to thank you for being and really kicking off the Traders Summit. You are uh, an amazing person, and uh, I love hearing your thoughts and ideas. And I know all of us here want to hear more of it. Guys, do you, do you have anything that you want to say to Daniel? Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. That, wow. That, uh, man, think... that's all I could say. Wow, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> I know I hold back too much, right? I'm just I'm too. You're so much. introverted, Danielle. I, I, you know, and you're you really can you get, get your energy level up a little bit. What a fantastic interview! I'm jealous Blake did it. What a great, <laughs> great interview! Thank you so much. Absolutely. My Steve, pleasure. did you have any, anything you want to say to Daniel? First of all, thank you very much. Uh, it, it was a wonderful interview. I wish we had more time. Uh, Blake, I, I, I do think that we need to organize another debate. I would really want to see uh, Mrs. DiMartino with Mark Dow. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> do, do, you, do you know Mark Dow, uh, Mrs. DiMartino? Uh, not personally. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he'll be yeah. here tomorrow. I, yeah. He'll be here tomorrow. I uh, I, I spoke with him <laughs> uh, one hour the other day. I, I know that your opinions diverge quite a lot. Um, I, I'm on your side on the side uh, on, on on your side of the field. Um, but I think you never get over the PTSD if you've worked on the inside ever, unless you're one of them, which I wasn't. So. <laughs> um, wow! How do you like to follow this? <laughs> Anyway, uh, I learned a lot from you today, Danielle. So, uh, Are there any burning questions from the audience? Others or no? did. Yeah, oh. how, anything from the audience? We have a couple minutes. Uh, I, I think I should read this one. I'm using, uh, Donna says, I'm using Zoom for the very first time. I'm 70 years old. And because of following uh, Danielle for months, I have become interested in economics and have learned, uh, learned so much from her. She's an amazing oh. woman and person. And I so very much appreciate her wisdom and willingness to share with all of us. So thank you. Uh, yeah. And my question to you is, how have you managed to do all this and at the same time continue to be such a fantastic mom and wife? You're, <laughs> you're truly an inspiration. Thank you. Um, it, it helps to, to, to 
kind of get rid of that notion of sleep being important. Fashion, you know. Um, but no, no uh, we, we have nine televisions around the, around our house, and really not enough room for all of them. And the children always know that I'm like this, trying to see Bloomberg behind him. So um, you just you just kind of roll with it. it. It's 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 really a difficult job. I have an amazing team at Quill Intelligence, and uh, and it's it's helpful that I was born with quite a bit of energy, but. But you made my day because you're 70 years old and you're you're on Zoom and I love that. I, I fantastic. A lot more comments I could read, but uh, I think it was the more you know the more indicative of you know the love people have for you here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you're planting great seeds, Danielle, and and no one's going to be a surprise that follows you what might happen. So you're also kind of a watchman for all of us. And we appreciate that. Well, it's, I can't do anything else. So I'm one of these lucky people who got to grow up and do what she really wanted. And that's, that's a gift. It is. It is indeed. Well, thank you once again, Danielle, for spending your time with us. We really appreciate it. And, um, and uh, we'll see you on the next debate in a couple months. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Thank you, <laughs> gentlemen. Right, thank you. Take Perfect. care. Have a wonderful rest of the day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Danielle. What that was amazing. Yeah, it was great. Good job, Blake. No, I, had, was. Know, I had fun. I had so much fun yeah. doing it. I, I could have done that for another couple hours. But I know we are jam packed with uh, with yeah. more going on. What's what's next on the schedule for uh, we us? We have uh, Mark Beaver, or is it Bolver from Pepperstone is gonna be with us, uh, a rep from Pepperstone to talk a little bit about uh, his firm and uh, what they do for uh, traders, both institutional and retail, and uh, just waiting for Mark to uh, arrive. Is uh, he here? He, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he is absolutely here. Let me uh, promote him. And after this 15-minute uh, segment, we have Mark Yusko. I think right. people should definitely stick around for Mark. Yeah, right. so to hear the other side of the Bitcoin argument, Mark is... Uh, an elite analyst uh, used to run Harvard's money, and you know uh, you you don't get into running Harvard's money without having some pedigree yourself. So yes, yes um, and the amazing so, thing about Mark is that uh, he's a very modern uh, person. He has been managing money the old-fashioned way for many many years, uh, but he's now also into cryptocurrency. So I think he combines the two worlds, so he can you know he can yeah. speak having. Uh, you know, a good um, viewpoint. Well, speaking of Marks, we have Mark here with us from Pepperstone. How you doing, Mark? Hi, hey, Mark. Nice to meet Hi. you. How is he? How are you guys going? All right. Uh, it must be late over there. You're in Australia, right? No, I'm uh, in London. So you. Oh, okay. So it's All just right. The uh, the start of the weekend for us. Cocktail so. hour then around, huh? Yeah, just uh, huh? a little bit later, but exactly that's the uh, that's the time. How long have you been with Pepperstone? So it's been uh, nearly 18 months now. So okay. it's, uh, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a, an absolutely fantastic journey. So uh, really enjoying my time there. And uh, hopefully I've got... So some... you've been in the industry before in a similar role? Yeah. Uh, and the, okay. So tell us what you like about Pepperstone. Well, I mean, it's... It's a really difficult market, uh, to, to be honest, as working as a broker. But what we have here is uh, we are a very agile company. Uh, we have been we started ten years ago, and we are a really agile company. And what I like is I'm coming from companies who are bigger than Pepperstone, and every time you want to change something, implement something for your client, it takes basically three or six months. You need to go through ten committees, and it's very long to to get fresh ideas. And in Pepperstone, uh, we can get things done really quickly. I really enjoy that. Uh, and we bring new tools and new stuff for our clients, uh, and that's really done really quickly. So uh, it's really inspiring to work for a company where everything goes quickly, and then you can actually have an impact on, on things. So it's uh, really good so far. Okay, and um, how many offices does Pepperstone have uh, across the globe? So we currently have six different offices around the world. Um, so the headquarters is in Melbourne, uh, in Australia, and we have also London, UK, Germany, uh, Dubai recently, and also in Cyprus. So uh, around five or six. So yeah. And main main regulator for Pepperstone? 
Um, that'll be FCA, ASIC, and DFCA as well. Uh, I've got a couple of slides actually that I would like to yeah. present to present to the go, audience. Go where for it, buddy. You've actually uh, already asked some of the questions. I'm, I... you know, that's <laughs> that's what I do. Absolutely, yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So hopefully you can see my screen for now. Got it. Yeah. All right. Let's Master go. the trade with Pepperstone showing up. Yeah, so I, I, you've introduced myself already. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you for the uh, opportunities to to let us speak and to to sponsoring the, this event. I, I think you have a great field of experts for the next three days. So I hope everyone enjoys um, this this weekend. So the slightly uh, annoying, boring bit about every presentation is uh, the risk warning, uh, as everyone knows. So I, I'll let everyone. Um, have a little read about about this one, um, and we'll go through the, the presentation um, very shortly. Um, so it's only for information learning purposes only, um, and yeah, please have a look on 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 this. Well, so just wanted to, to introduce Pepperstone to to everyone uh, attending the meeting. So some of you probably trade with us, some of you guys probably don't trade with us, or have never heard of us. So just really quick numbers uh, about us. So as I said, we, st we started in 2010. Uh, we are a top global uh, FX and CFD broker. Um, we have around 57,000 active traders in, in the world, which is, which is, quite, uh, which is quite large. Uh, in idea of volumes for you guys trading and, and active traders, we process approximately $12.5 billion notional of trade per day. Um, just to give you an idea how large this is. Regarding the offices already um, give an explanation. We have offices in London, Melbourne, Dubai, Dusseldorf, and Cyprus. Um, we recently gained a lot of awards. So in the last year, approximately 16 awards we got for, for client satisfaction or platform. Uh, we awarded best MT4 broker, best global Globe broker, which we're really proud of uh, and shows the commitment that we have to, to bring uh, good platforms and product to our clients. Uh, in terms of Security and strength uh, with really strong balance sheets. Uh, all the clients found are regulated and, and segregated in tier one banks. And we regulated in UK by the FCA, in Australia by ASIC, uh, DFCA in Dubai. And we have a couple more licenses coming up in Europe uh, due to Brexit. For, for everyone trading there, so whatever you, you've been trading for a long time or, or just starting, um, just wanted to, to show that the couple of markets we offer. So we have over 180 instruments to, to trade for our clients, which is quite large. So going for Forex, so all the, the major minor pairs, the exotic pairs as well. Uh, we're offering all indices, all major indices, um, Dow, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, DAX, UK 100, S&P and, and more. Uh, commodities, uh, which uh, have been in the highlights recently. So gold, silver, crude as well, of course, soft commodities. Cryptos as well for the crypto traders uh, and US equities, uh, all the top US equities with pre and post market pricing for anyone trading earnings. Uh, it's absolutely essential to, for you to have pre and post market pricing as, as we offer. Um, just really quickly on, on anyone um, not doing the product we offer. So we offer CFD trading for all our clients and we offer spread betting as well for UK and Ireland residents only. It's a tax efficient product for, for UK and Irish residents. Uh, they all leverage product. Uh, you can go long and short uh, and you can trade pretty much 24 hours a day on every product. Um, if you're new to trading, if you don't really know any of the products we offer, uh, uh, please give us a call, uh, send us an email. We're very happy to go through our product offering and what a CFD and its properties. Uh, I assume most of you are experienced traders, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, just really quick words regarding the platforms uh, we offer. We offer three of the most reliable and fast platform in the industry. Uh, MT4, who's um, the world's most popular trading platform, um, really good for also automatic trading, implementing some, some tools, indicators. Uh, MT5, which is the most recent version, uh, slightly more powerful than MT4, but has most the same functionality than, than MT4 as well. And we also offer CTrader, who's um, slightly different, probably more on the institutional side of things. If you used to work in banking, that's probably the platform you, you prefer. Uh, but as well, all the platforms are on desktop, uh, mobile, iOS. Uh, and so 
you can actually trade on the go as well. Any questions about the platform as well, uh, really feel free to, to reach out to us and we'll give you a, a demo with all account managers. So what's uh, really important for, for me, what I'd like everyone to, to know on, on this is what we offer all our clients. So if you're not a Beverson client and you, you're currently uh, considering changing broker, you're looking at different brokers around, um, you know, we, we're really good at execution, pricing, and technology, uh, but when it comes to your broker, you, you really want um, people behind uh, the screen as well. So we offer 24 uh, hours support, five, five days a week on, in six or seven different languages. So what's really important to us is that if you have any issues or any questions, anything you don't understand, you just want to reach out to us. There's always something available over the phone, over live chat, over email. So that's really important to us. And we're committed to give our clients a really good service and, and support. Uh, in terms of market analysis and research, we have a great team. Um, you will probably meet uh, Chris Weston. Most of you guys on, on the call know Chris. Uh, he's going to do a presentation here as well on Sunday. He's our head of research. Um, produces a lot of analysis for clients. Uh, every morning, Chris produces a daily fix. Um, which is in the early hours in, uh, in Australia will give you the headline of the markets coming up. So it's, it's a great email to receive every day to ahead of, ahead of trading during the day, uh, getting to know what's, what's going to happen. Uh, we also uh, invite all our clients to large trading events as of today. Uh, really keen on doing online events, especially with COVID situation now. So pretty much all online. We do a lot of them. We want to give you... Uh, some content uh, for you to improve your trading. We also offer some weekly webinars with the FX Evo team. Some of the FX Evo guys are actually on the call that you, you get to know them or you already know them. We also work with Korean Academy, uh, which I'm going to show a page on slightly later. We, we also offer Auto Chartist, which is for, for some of you guys who, who don't know chart, this is actually a really good tool. Uh, it's one of the best market uh, screening tool uh, in the industry. We offer this for free if you're a client of Pepperstone. doesn't only give you some trade indication, but also helps you to manage your, your risk, which is, uh, as you all know, very important. Uh, and we also offer to all our clients uh, what's called the Smart Trader Tools. So it's a set of 28 indicators and, and risk management tool. Um, they are excellent tools. Uh, we, I do recommend you to have a look if you've never tried them. Um, they've actually helped uh, many of our clients to, uh, to improve on the trading. Um, just wanted to touch base on benefits if you are a professional client of Pepperstone. I know that there are some professional traders uh, here in this call. Uh, so we offer all the features you've seen in, in the previous page, but we also offer some extra features as uh, to cover you all your advanced need, of course. So you'll have a dedicated uh, relationship manager to, to help you uh, get your account set up, to navigate through the platforms or getting some, some more research. Anything you need, you'll have a dedicated uh, relationship manager, which is, I think, really important. Uh, we will give you free access to the advanced Forex Analytics platform. Uh, some of the guys from Forex Analytics are uh, in this event as well. So I'm sure you'll have some couple of demos on the platform, but it's one of the best platform in terms of uh, FX research and, and screening. So that's a massive tool to get for free if you're um, a client of us on the professional side of things. Uh, you get access to exclusive events uh, reserved to professional clients as well, which is great for, for meeting um, like-minded traders or the professional traders. Uh, always great to, to get some new connections uh, in there. Of course, it comes with increased leverage, possibly some credit facilities and some rewards for referring your friends. Um, so if you are a professional client, if you're interested in becoming a professional client, uh, you can contact us on the email on that slide. And also please bear in mind that uh, being a professional client, you will lose some, a few protection as, as a retail client, such as a negative balance. One thing to, to finish um, my short presentation is we are just starting a new series uh, of webinars starting on Wednesday. So from Wednesday evening, uh, 7.30 uh, UK time, uh, we're offering for free to, to all our clients to join us um, in partnership with Corellian. So it's, uh, it's a fantastic webinar uh, over 13 weeks where you, you're basically gonna follow three um, advanced and expert traders. So three guys with Korean who have been working in the market 
uh, all the career, uh, focusing on strategy, focusing on technical analysis, and also trading uh, psychology. Uh, so it's a great event to attend uh, every Wednesday, 7.30. I'm, I'm going to put the link in the chat for anyone who, who want to, to register. And it'll be absolutely fantastic for, for you to join us. Uh, and I'm sure you'll get some uh, really good uh, insight about uh, a couple more things as well. Um, if you want to, if you want to contact us, any questions about Pepperson, if you'd like to know more about our services or pricing or products, uh, this is our contact detail over the phone, emails, um, live chat, feel free to give us a buzz. Uh, we'll be more than happy to answer any question you have or help you going through another provider for, for, for your trading. And that's pretty much it for me, guys. Uh, a, couple quick, a couple quick questions for you, Mark. Absolutely. Do they have, does Pepperstone have an API for automated FX trading? Yes, we do. So that would be done. So there are different ways to trade automatic with Pepperstone. So either with EAs on MT4, MT5. Uh, there's also an API with our C-Trader platform that's available. And for any institutional or professional trader wants it, uh, wanting a fixed API, we also have, we also offer a fixed API connection for for, for um, let's say really uh, big traders on FX or indices. So yeah, there are a couple of options, and we're really happy to go through them. Uh, if there's any clients wanting to implement APIs, we, we're actually quite good on them. Okay, we're going to have to ask you any further questions for Mark to use his email to contact him. We have to move on. Mark, uh, thank you very much. Uh, no great problem. presentation of uh, an elite brokerage firm, thank Pepperstone. You. Thank you very much. Put the link in there and have a good weekend. And thank you for, uh, for having me. Very thank welcome. you very much, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. So next on deck, uh, Justine Underhill is going to be interviewing uh, our friend Mark Yusko and shy girl Tracy Schuchert. So I'm um, is Justine with us, Steve? Uh, yes, she is. Let me promote her so she can actually share her uh, camera. Hello, Justine. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you and we can oh, see wonderful. you. Wonderful. I have really been enjoying the programming so far. It's been great. Uh, Nice to meet you, Justine. Oh, a little nice bit, to meet you. Yeah, a little bit about Justine. Uh, she's an, an award-winning documentarian and news journalist, and she was focused on finance and technology. Her docuseries with Real Vision, who we are familiar with, Discoveries, which uncovers the hidden side of technology, finance, and science, was recognized for excellence by the Tele Awards. And she previously worked at Yahoo Finance as a host and on-air reporter, covering the Fed, energy markets, and breaking news. And it's a pleasure to have you here to uh, interview Mark and Tracy. And I, you know, it's uh, a skill to be a good host and anchor too, isn't it, Justine? Well, Not to you you're doing a fantastic job so far. Oh, well, you know, uh, you have to ask the questions that you know your listeners and viewers might want to ask themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So I, I look forward to watching you work and oh. the interviews. Welcome Dale, I've had the pleasure of, it. I've had the pleasure of uh, having Justin uh, interview me once. Yes, So at, I'm, at Real uh, Vision. Yeah, so oh. I'm really, yeah, so I'm really happy uh, we, we have her with us. Oh, and she remembers it, unlike I, oh. <laughs> unlike me, Steve, from FX Street, and uh, I didn't remember. Oh, okay. Well, take it away, Justine. Sure. Well, I am super excited to talk to Mark Yusko, not for the first time. I've interviewed him before, actually, at Real Vision. Um, Mark Yusko, in case you don't know, is the founder and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. He's also the managing partner of Morgan Creek Digital Assets. So it'll be interesting to get his take on Bitcoin, especially after what we heard from Danielle DiMartino Booth on that. Uh, he was also previously the CIO and founder of UNC Management Company, which is the endowment investment firm uh, for UNC Chapel Hill. So it'll be interesting also to get his take from an endowment investing perspective on what's going on in the markets. So with that, Mark, welcome. Great to see you. Uh, Mark, 
no sound. Well, okay, now I'm uh, unmuted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great to oh. see you, Justine, and I, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you didn't bring up the fact of how you smashed me and connect <laughs> last time we were together, because I, I kind of <laughs> wanted a rematch today, uh, but uh, I, I don't think losing three out of three would be good for my ego. Oh man, I'm, I've, I've, my skills in Connect Four have definitely dropped. I practiced for that interview. <laughs> So far. Welcome to the <laughs> summit, Mark. Welcome, Mark. Good I just want to say to hi Steve. before before you we leave you at it. Uh, I'm I'm really glad to have you again, and I'm really looking forward both for the interview and tomorrow's debate. Ah, uh, can't you, you know how I hate to debate? So I think tomorrow's not going to be any fun at all, right? Yeah. I actually yeah. I actually think it's going to be great for the viewers, and I, I have more than enough confidence that you're going to be great. That's going to be great. It's going to be great. So but, enjoy. Uh, Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. We won't go too much into topics that you might be debating tomorrow, but there are things that we do have to discuss. Um, I heard that you went on a trip across the country. Um, yes. And this cross country trip allowed you to not just see the economic, I mean, see economic pain firsthand, but not just see, see the data and the numbers that we've been reading about, but actually experience yeah, it. Yeah, you know, there's this great line about traveling right and and it enables you to separate reality from narrative mm -hmm. and you know you can hear or listen to all the people talking about oh it's the greatest economy ever or you know there's a recovery going on uh, look i, I the, the the short version of a long story is my wife and son and i set out on this cross-country journey uh, one to see my father-in-law's 84th birthday in tulsa and then to mm -hmm. go hang out with my eldest daughter who was having a baby which she did so now we have two grandkids and um congrats she's, thank you she's in santa monica california so we drove all the way across country and then all the way back 14 states over six weeks and the short conclusion is there is no recovery on main hmm. street i hmm. saw more pain and suffering in the six weeks than i've seen in in 20 years um just punctuated by Santa Fe, New Mexico, one out of every three businesses boarded up, uh, no visitors, the shopkeepers we could find to talk to were shutting down at the end of the month. Uh, the hotel we were at, which had been full to the brim, the last two times I was there, three cars. Uh, it's, mm. it's bad out there. And all this narrative and, and focus on the stock market making new highs, at least it was making new highs until recently, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, is kind of crazy. Yeah, how how do you actually reconcile that the economic pain that we are feeling versus I mean we're still at levels S and P is at levels above where it was a year ago. Yeah, look, it's it's all part of the plan, and it's it's something called money illusion. So there's this illusion that stocks are rising, but that's because everybody denominates them in U.S. dollars. If you denominate them in real money, right, gold, they're down forty four percent over the last two years. If you denominate it in real, real money, Bitcoin, they're down 80 something percent. So uh, stores of value are rising. Uh, the Fed is committed to destroying the currency. That's the only way out, right? Once a government gets fully over indebted, the only way out is to devalue your currency. And the rich get really, really, really rich on paper. They feel rich. Um, but what happens ultimately is that divide grows to such levels. Historically, there's uprisings. I'm not saying there's going to be an uprising in the U.S., although, mm. man, I'll tell you, some of the stuff we saw, it was, it was getting close. It's getting close. And your, your trip across the U.S. pretty much went through southern states. Is that correct? Well, we went through the middle first. So mm -hmm. we went North Carolina, Virginia. Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, top of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, then back California, Arizona, into New Mexico, southern part of Texas, into Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, South Carolina. So we made pretty much a triangle. And it was interesting, mostly red states, mm -hmm. uh, a couple blue states, New Mexico, Calif uh, California. But here's the thing. They used to be really, really red. Like four years ago when I traveled to Alabama, every yard had a Trump sign in it. Hmm. This time, not so much. Um, hmm. So I, I think it's going to be a very interesting election. I actually 
think it's going to be very interesting and unexpected uh, for people. But uh, there's, like I said, there's, there's just a big sea change going on on Main Street. And, and to your question, to answer mm-hmm. your question, why does it exist? Well, look, it's the mission of the Fed since 1913 to create income and wealth inequality, right? That's, that's their mission. And they're saying, oh, that's ridiculous. No, that's their mission. Their mission is to make the rich, particularly the bankers, really, really rich and to steal from the poor in the form and the middle class in the form of inflation. And I'll give you one inflation story that was just so scary. So we go to the Grand Canyon. And by the way, I can't believe it took me 57 years to go to the Grand Canyon. I'm an idiot. I should have gone there long before. Most amazing thing I've seen. And we get there. 20% occupancy. The lodge we were staying at, two cars, no one there, no crowds, no nothing. And I go into town uh, to try to get some internet service because there's no internet at the Grand Canyon, which was weird. Um, it's kind of weird to be in a place where there's no internet and no phone service. It's, it's good uh, in a way though, I think. It's good. No, it was good, <laughs> except it's a little freaky when you're trying to keep tabs on parents and is the baby coming? But uh, I went to a McDonald's to try to, you know, s- uh, surf some Wi-Fi and uh, ordered breakfast for my nine-year-old and I. Normally in Chapel Hill, costs us about 12 bucks, two big breakfasts, coffee, et cetera. The guy says, $28. I'm like, what do you mean $28? He says, well, yeah, we, we don't have any volume because no one's coming to the canyon, so we raise prices. He said, no, no, this is McDonald's. It's like, it's like national prices. No, 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 we're a franchisee. We're going to raise prices. So that's a really bad plan. Think about this. Think about being a park ranger who's been furloughed, doesn't have a lot of money because he can't work or she can't work. And now you go to McDonald's because you think it's cheap and they tripled the prices. That's bad. Yeah. And that, that's what will cause unrest. Wow. And that, I mean, getting that sort of on the ground experience, it almost reminds me of... Um, in the big short when there was such a dis I mean, at least some of the traders and there was a, such a disconnect between, you know, what was actually going on in let's say Florida versus yeah. uh, what was being reported on the books. And so it almost seems in this way, like what your experience was, was completely disconnected from what's being reported out there. Look, or at least with the stock market. There's such a doing. disconnect. I mean, the disconnection is, is so extreme. And I, I talked about this in, uh, we do these weekly um, webinars and I talked about this uh, last week. Mm -hmm. That last Wednesday, so a week ago Wednesday, to me was the peak of the market, right? The peak of tech bubble two and tech rec two has started. It was the IPO of Snowflake. (laughs) Now, look, full disclosure, my son works there. So I'm really, really happy about how crazy it was. But the valuation of Snowflake at 227 times sales, not 227 times revenue or earnings, wow. 227 times sales sets a new record for stupidity. And the people that bought that stock because Warren Buffett said he was buying the IPO are going to lose a lot of money, like a lot, a lot of money. And I think just like Blackstone in 07 was the top of the financial crisis, hmm. just like Glencore in 11 was the top of the commodity boom. And you can go back to 2000, a bunch of crazy like pets.com IPOs. Um, this was the top. And I, I think the, the pain is just getting started. So that disconnect, I think, is going to start to shrink. Hmm. But, you know, we'll see. Do you see that for all tech companies that there is going to be a downturn? Or is it so across the board? Oh, Google, it, look, Facebook, Amazon, everything. Here's the problem. The market today, the stock market, is no longer a market of companies. It's a market of little tickers, little four symbol tickers that no one, they've totally disconnected from the underlying company. Mm. And it's been popularized by, you know, the day trading guys who reach into Scrabble bag and pull out four letters and buy that ticker as if it's some gambling game. That's just like it was in 2000 when we had the day trading boom the first time. And when people buy things just because they're going up or buy things just because they're hot, that's when the real pain is going to start. So you have companies Mm. selling 20, 30, 50 zoom we're using right now sells it over a hundred times revenues. There's no math on the planet, right? There's no interest rate low enough. There's no growth rate high enough where you can put a dollar, I mean, pay $100 for a dollar of revenue, which then has pennies 
of profit and make a good return. So <laughs> it works for a while, but once it starts to crash, which I believe it has, the ugliness is, is profound. Uh, do, you, do you see a dynamic where let's say there is general pain in other parts of the world? And so that leads to uh, there is no other alternative to investing in the US market. And so it's, suddenly you have a flood of money almost no matter what. Uh, look, it's a great point. And there is pain everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. the, the idiocy of administrations, not just in the US, but a lot of administrations other than China, who's actually playing the game flawlessly, uh, is really crazy. And, and global trade is collapsing. Uh, that's usually a bad sign. Not, not usually, it is a bad sign. And it feels very much like the 1930s in that respect, uh, the last time we saw this kind of just bad global policies and a, and a focus on nationalism and populism instead of globalization. And so I, I do think that there is this belief, and it is a belief, I don't think it's actually truth, but I think it's a belief that Tina, you know, there is no alternative. You should just buy U.S. stocks because they're the best. Well, again, that works as long as it's working. But at some point, someone will say, this doesn't make sense. And then that cash will flow to stores of value, which it already has, right? Gold is outperforming stocks this year. Gold's up 20%, stocks are not. Right, their basic stocks. The S and P is basically flat. Nasdaq's up a little bit, but gold's ahead. Long bonds are outperforming stocks again, just like they did the year before. Bitcoin outperforming stocks, like not close. Bitcoin's the best performing asset again, just like it was last year, just like it has been the last ten years, and it's because we're destroying the value of the currency everywhere in the U.S., in Japan, in Europe, in Brazil in Argentina, everyone is devaluing their currency and it's a race to the bottom. And all that really does is inflate scarce assets. So low, you know, high quality real estate, diamonds, collectible Porsches, anything that's scarce is going up. And that gives you this illusion of prosperity. But the reality underneath is what I witnessed on this road trip. Pain, hmm. look, homelessness in America off the charts. Nashville, Tennessee, supposed to be a boom town, tent cities everywhere. Austin, Texas, supposed to be a boom town, tent cities everywhere. We are back to Hooverville. We are, I, we are definitely back to Hooverville. I saw some of the, the photos that you posted and they, they were actually quite, quite uh, stark. Um, well, it's crazy to think that I, I could take those pictures just walking down the street like it was no big deal. And um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Now, you mentioned gold um, and you have your own uh, FANG uh, gold stocks. Yes. Uh, could, you, yes. could you talk us through, and I, I have the list here if you don't happen to remember what the F-A-A-A-N-G is. Yeah, the so there's F, three A's, an N and a G. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, the new FANG. So here's an interesting stat, right? From the bottom of the crisis, FANG, the ticker symbol, which is Diamondback Energy, has actually outperformed Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And everybody's, that's impossible. Those things are up a lot. Well, energy got so cheap that it was actually at more. And, and Shiger will have, Tracy will have some, mm -hmm. some thoughts on that for sure. But Fang, the new Fang, which is Franco Nevada, Anglo Go Eagle Mines, uh, Anglo Ashanti Gold, Gold Corp, uh, Newmont uh, Mining, and Barrett Gold. So F-A-A-A-N-G, those six stocks are up twice as much as the market. And I think they're going to go up, continue to go up more than the market. And uh, so I think you should be shorting FANG like the uh, tech ones, and you should be buying the new FANG. Yeah. Now, for these, because a lot of these gold miners, I mean, do you, do you see there being a huge amount of risk to getting into that rather than just... Um, Getting into no, not at all. In fact, just fund. the opposite. Okay. These companies actually mint, pun intended, money. They are making more money. They made more money in second quarter than they ever have in their history. Why? Because their output, right, gold, silver, et cetera, the, the things that they sell are going up. The price is going up. But the things that they need as inputs, electricity, oil, are all going down. And so it's a beautiful thing. Your margins are expanding. Snowflake. Snowflake has $260 million of revenue and they lost 
$350 million. And yet they were valued at $96 billion for a few seconds. Absolute insanity, right? How can you lose $350 million on revenues of $250 million? I, I still haven't figured out how you do that. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty hard. Yeah. So then I, going into gold, I mean, also you have your long short fund that's been doing quite well this year. Could you talk a little bit about what's the long part and then the yeah. short part of that fund? Yeah, so it's, it's an important thing. So we have this hybrid long short fund and it allocates some of the money to external managers, some you know, great hedge funds in tech and healthcare and, and uh, uh, value. I have a great manager in Australia that everybody knows um, that you know, they look for both longs and shorts. Then we supersize on a direct basis the best ideas both on the long and the short side. So right now we are uh, shifting from the kind of fang overweight, which we have been in uh, earlier this year, to more value. So we're shifting to value. And that's, that's been painful. We've been early. That's the euphemism for wrong. Uh, so, so far that hasn't worked out that well. But uh, so we're long, you know, some of the materials companies, some of the energy companies. Uh, and energy's done nicely, but it hasn't done quite as, as well as we, we think it should. Uh, we still own a little bit of, of tech, and, but we own digital transformation companies. So we own companies that are on the edge of this transition from electronic to the digital world, not necessarily just things that support Bitcoin and crypto, but things that support cloud or, you know, the Amazon roadkill, where basically people aren't going to shop, you know, physically, they're going to shop virtually. So there's mm -hmm. lots of things. And what COVID did is it pushed forward about three years of this digital transformation. In fact, on my uh, webinar yesterday, I had a, a cartoon of this, this group sitting in a boardroom on the top floor of a building saying, you know, digital transformation is still years away. We don't need to change at all. And outside, there's a giant wrecking ball labeled COVID about to hit their building. And uh, that's what's happened, right? This work from anywhere, right? I spent six weeks on the road, didn't miss a beat. I worked from hotel rooms. I worked from homes. I actually gave my, my webinar two weeks ago from the backseat of a car on the way to Austin, Texas, when my wife drove. So you really can work from anywhere. And uh, I'm actually the biggest beneficiary of it because my daughter and son-in-law are now going to move to North Carolina from LA because their company has gone totally virtual. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really... So that's, that's part of the long side. On the short mm -hmm. side... We are short, short some of the most egregiously overvalued tech companies. We're also like, short- Like which, which companies? Oh, uh, truth be told, we, we still are short a little teeny tiny bit of, of Tesla, although um, not as much as we once were. Um, but uh, I, I think that one's going to go down a lot at some point. But, but that, that's a little position. But you know, a lot of the cloud companies- um, are, are, you know, in, it's kind of a basket of, of cloud companies. I don't want to pick on anyone in particular. Um, you know, we, we still believe in, in some of the, like the Amazon roadkill. So we still do own some Amazon, even though I think it's wildly mm -hmm. overvalued, but it's because we're short against it, the brick and mortar uh, retailers, which have been going down more. So even though I don't think Amazon will go up a lot from here, I think the other things will go down more. Uh, we are short kind of traditional media. Uh, we think that, you know, business is, is a dying business. Uh, we're short some of the um, traditional, again, brick and mortar stores beyond just, you know, retail and apparel, uh, things like grocery stores and, and things like that. So interesting. So, but grocery stores, wouldn't you say, have done somewhat well during the pandemic? They certainly have. And I and think that's we think that's an ephemeral thing, right? I think mm -hmm. people swapped restaurant spending for grocery spending, but it wasn't big enough, we don't think, to justify the, the move up. So, um, And I think the biggest thing for us right now on the short side is um, this migration back to fair value. I think once it begins, it becomes very durable and, and it's not going to be a quick like sharp down. In fact, Bob Farrell talks about this. Every bear market, um, he was a famous Maryland strategist. Every bear market has a sharp down, that was March, a reflexive rebound where the people are like, oh no, no, it's all gonna go back to normal. 
and then a protracted fundamental downturn. And I think that's where we are today. And again, if you look back to the 1930s, you know, in, in September 29, we started down. We went down through November. Then from November till May of 30, we went up 48% from hmm. bottom to trough. Then the real downdraft started. So the crash really wasn't 29 alone. It was really 30 and 31 that caused the real pain. And I think that's where we're headed uh, in the markets here. And, and that pain lasted for a year, more than a year, actually a year and a half, two years. Yeah, about a year and a half. And then the yeah. real pain, Justine, to, to that point was the idiotic moves by the government to do smoot holly, right? Trade mm -hmm. barriers. Uh, to try to isolate America, to try to save American jobs. They literally rounded up, they had the Mexican Repatriation Act. Imagine this, they went around, physically grabbed people of Mexican descent, even if they're American citizens, and physically moved them back to Mexico to try to <laughs> save jobs. Sounds really familiar to the current environment. And the craziness of that period turned what was a garden variety recession into the Great Depression. <laughs> and I think we're in a garden variety recession enhanced by COVID, but COVID was a shock like 9-11. It doesn't, it, it won't last forever, but the responses to that shock, mm. if they're really bad, which they have been so far, like lockdowns are really not very uh, well advised. If those responses continue to be bad and we do things like throw up trade barriers and we, you know, go inward instead of outward, I think it could turned this garden variety recession into something much worse. And as I said, what I saw on the road says we're on the verge of that already. Hmm. Would you say that uh, the 29 depression is the most analogous depression recession situation to today? It's more um, than it's like, absolutely say, analogous. 2000, 2008 or any no, 1987. Two, I don't know, we can keep going back to other No, ones. it's a fantastic, very insightful question. Everyone likes to compare it to the global financial crisis. This is not the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis was an unwinding of excess leverage in the financial system. The financial system isn't as levered today. The banks aren't as levered. Uh, hedge funds aren't as levered. I mean, some hedge funds are, but most hedge funds aren't as levered. Financial institutions, there's, there's not the crazy lending that was going on where if you could fog a mirror, actually, if you didn't even have to fog a mirror, you could get a loan. Uh, they were just making stuff up, uh, the liar loans. Um, so that's not the problem. And it's even not like 2000 is a little bit analogous because the valuation of tech stocks is very similar and the debt levels are very similar. But the reason this is more like 2930 is in 29, we had a 10 year crazy period, right? We had the, the roaring 20s where everybody literally lost their mind. They, they, they levered up, they speculated, they became day traders, they left their jobs to trade stocks. And the government did everything they could to try to perpetuate this myth of prosperity. And so they increased leverage and we got to massive government debt levels. And then you had the aha moment, right? The crash where everybody said, uh oh, and you got big margin calls. And then you started to have the unwind. And again, then the government made the bad decisions to constrain liquidity. So the one thing the Fed has done right this time even though I don't like it, is they have kept liquidity ample, which has increased the size and scope of the bubble and put off the pain. But like anything where you do that, if you put off going to the dentist, when you eventually go, you get the root canal. Or if you put off going to the doctor, when you finally get that heart attack, it's really bad. So you should try to take care of things early and this obsession, I call it the participation trophy world that we live in, this obsession with not letting failure happen mm. is crazy. I mean, think about, yeah. think about this. You got a kid, they come home from school, they have four A's and a D. What does the average American parent do? <gasps> oh my gosh, we got to get you a tutor. You got to spend all your time on this D. No, drop the class with the D and focus on the thing they're good at because you don't have to be good at everything. And we have companies out there, 40%, 40% of companies can't cover their debt service mm. with their EBITDA. 
forget paying back the debt. They could never pay back the debt. They can't even pay the debt service, the interest. So we should let those companies fail, but no one wants to let companies fail because those are voters and everybody thinks they got to save everything. So you know, we're going to keep handing money out to people. UBI, maybe one of the dumbest things ever created. It's just communism with a nice label. Um, and making people the same and taking away incentive to create and innovate is just a recipe for disaster. Again, it's what we did in the 30s. I hope we don't do it again. It was a massive deleveraging to some extent in 2008. Uh, do you see that happening in the next year, two years, three years? Do you see some of these cycles coming to fruition? Again, really insightful question. You know, the leverage in the uh, household is really high, right? Households, you know, they're up to their eyeballs in debt. It's the only way they can survive. Governments up to their eyeballs in debt. Um, corporations up to their eyeballs in debt. Highest levels of, of corporate leverage. The problem is, as um, you know, Ray Dalio at Bridgewater talks about, you know, what you want is a beautiful deleveraging, right? A, an orderly deleveraging. The problem is, Deleveragings usually don't happen that way. They usually happen sharply, uh, like they did in 08 and 09, like they did in 02. And 02 to me is the better analogy than, than 08, 09. This is a corporate debt problem and an individual debt problem. And just like WorldCom and Enron in 2002, I think Nikola is the first shot across the bow. The fact that this miracle company that everybody loved and was going to be the next Tesla might be a fraud and all the people that lent them money are not going to get their money back. If there are more frauds, like if Tesla turns out to be a fraud or if somebody else turns out to be a fraud, then it could get ugly in a hurry and people mm -hmm. will ask for their money back. And there's that famous picture, I don't know if you've seen it, of the Knickerbocker bank run in 1907 where you know, J.P. Morgan leaked a rumor about his competitor, the Knickerbocker Trust, because the Knickerbocker Trust was taking all the business from J.P. Morgan's beloved um, J.P. Morgan. And he leaked a rumor that they didn't have enough money to pay depositors, so it triggered a bank run. And of course, he was there to pick up the pieces like, you know, Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life, um, based on a true story. And uh, that's how we got the Fed, right? Because John D. Rockefeller's uh, I'm sorry, J.P. Morgan's best friend was John D. Rockefeller, mm -hmm. whose father-in-law was Amory Aldrich, who then created the Aldrich plan saying, look, we need a central bank to save us from these crazy trusts, which we bankrupted, by the way. And so it all comes together. And then they created the silly thing on Jekyll Island. You can't make this up. And so a friend of mine was just saying, Mark, next year we need to have a, a get together in Jekyll Island. I'm like, oh, that would be so awesome. So oh. we may actually go there and do an oh, event. Yeah, that would, you should do like a podcast or something, host some sort of event from there. <laughs> oh, we want to do like a live get together oh, macro awesome. event. Oh, yeah. <laughs> get everybody that's online now, we'll all come physically to Jekyll Island and have a big party to celebrate the uh, the demise of the Fed. So. Oh my gosh. Well, actually, um, you know, going on this historic trend, we do have a, a question here, which I think is interesting. Um, we have this person asking if, you know, there are fewer that could take profit from a crash in 1929 because you didn't have the extensive, of, extensive shorting market that you do now. Yeah. Um, so is it easier to actually profit in um, so some sort of downturn today than let's say in 1929? Wow, fantastic question. And, and, and it's the reason we love long short equity. I mean, if you go back in time, it's 100% true that in the 20s and 30s, again in the 60s, it was very difficult to really profit from these big downdrafts uh, on this 60 year cycle. And so we're back to that kind of 60 year cycle with a downtrend likely. And in fact, it's pretty amazing. You know, I was in West Texas, in the middle of nowhere, right near where W.D. Gann was born. And he's the guy that, that wrote this book in 1901 that laid out every market peak and trough um, over the next 150 years. And he predicted that 2020 would be a bad year, just like he predicted 29 would be a crash, just like he predicted 73 and 2000 and 2008. So pretty good predictor, um, all based on this Benner cycle from 1864 from Samuel Benner. Long story short is 
we, we knew the pain was coming and we couldn't fix it in the past, but starting really in kind of 2000-ish, if you look at the 2001, 2002 period, the markets were down 40%, hedge funds were up 10%. In 2008, 2009, everybody said, oh, hedge funds don't work anymore, shorting doesn't work anymore because the market was down 45 and hedge funds were down 20. Well, that's because it was a liquidation and people got liquidated and they were forced to sell what they had to sell rather than what they wanted to sell. I think this time, because there's not as much leverage in the system, what we've seen and why our fund's up you know, over 20% this year, the short side is really kicking in. And ExxonMobil is one of my favorite poster children, right? Mm. We got short this thing a long time ago, and it's not that we think it's going to demise quickly. It's just it's in a horrible place. It has two different businesses, refining and exploration and production. So no matter which way oil prices go, they make a little and they lose a little. So they're basically just a conglomerate. But the problem is conglomerates with high expense ratios basically are going to erode in value. And that's exactly what that stock's done. And Julia Robertson has this great line about shorting. A short doesn't have to go down to be great as long as it finances a better long. Mm. And so why the long short strategy is so good is I can short something like Exxon. I don't even need it to go away. I just need it to not go up so that then I can buy one of these digital disruptors on the long side and make money that way. Interesting. Now, um, we have another question here um, from AG who says, does Mark think that we might go into a stagflation period? Do you think that would be possible? Yeah, I, I don't. And and look, I, I'm, I'm going against one of the people I admire most in this business, Kirill Sokoloff. Mm. Kirill Sokoloff runs 13D Research, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Mm. Uh, been fortunate to have him as a friend and mentor for many years. I came across, I literally stumbled across a book that he co-authored with Gary Schilling back in the 70s that no one read. Um, and even I didn't read the whole thing, but I read the cover. And the cover was, Inflation's Ending, Are You Ready? written in 1981. So no one thought inflation could ever, you know, happen. And so inflation did happen, obviously. And uh, I mean, I mean every, no one thought inflation could stop because we just had the big inflation in the 70s. And inflation has stopped and it's gone down for 30 plus years. And so now he's on the side of saying that inflation is coming back. And that's why he loves gold and gold miners. I like gold and gold miners for a different reason. I like them for deflation. I think we're stuck in a deflationary death spiral. So I see no inflation other than that McDonald's I was talking about, um, <laughs> which well, that's, that's real. That's, that's real. Yeah. Um, but that is offset by the deflation in everything else. Real estate prices are going to collapse, particularly urban center real estate as people flee, right? They're going to yeah. move to a place like North Carolina where you can get a lot more house and you can work from there. So real estate prices are going to collapse. I think the problem we have is, People believe inflation is always and everywhere in a monetary phenomenon, Milton Friedman. It's not. It's a demographic phenomenon. You have inflation when you have lots of young people. When you have lots of 25 to 45-year-old people, you have lots of inflation because 25 to 45-year-old people are not very productive. doesn't mean they're not perfectly nice people. They're just not productive in the way we measure productivity because they're still learning. So companies have to borrow in the form of higher prices to train their young workers. So if you look at every country around the world that has high inflation, India, for example, they have lots mm -hmm. of 25 to 45 year olds. On the flip side, 65 to 85 year olds are not very productive either. Again, perfectly nice people, but they're not productive. The, all the productivity in an economy happens with 45 to 65 year olds. So every baby bust country, Europe, Japan, US is all on the far end of this graying demographic. And that's going to put huge deflationary forces. So I call it the killer Ds. You have bad demographics, 10,000 mm. people turn 65 every day. You have too much debt. Debt is highly deflationary because it crowds out spending and wealth creation and innovation, particularly government debt, the worst possible kind, which our current administration thinks is a good thing. Uh, so they're creating lots of it, which is bad for the future. Look up Lacey Hunt if you're curious about that. So de demographics plus debt equals deflation. So I see no inflation. In fact, here's a prediction. Every interest rate in the world soon, probably sooner than anyone believes, will be negative. 
forget high rates. We're going to have negative interest rates everywhere in the planet. Even the U.S.? Within, within five years, in the U.S. In the you, U.S., everywhere. That everywhere. would... So, neg- I mean, a lot of things are like based on U.S. interest rates, but whether yes, it's like Black Scholes formulas, all sorts of other things. Don't you think that would cause like huge ripple effects? I'm like, of course. Look, yeah, look okay. at the Japanese banks. 26 years, they've gone down. Look at European banks making new lows every day because they have negative interest rates. We will have negative interest rates. Look, we're at 0. 0.65 on the 10-year. 0. Mm. 0.65. A year ago, we were over 2%. And everybody thought we we're going to 5 Look. The, the bond kings, Gunlock and a bunch of others said, we're going to 5% rates. We're at 0.65. We will have negative rates because think about it. If 40% of companies today can't pay interest with sub 1% rates, how would they pay interest with 2% rates or 3% rates or 4% rates? They can't. So interest rates will continue to go down. And it's not until the echo boom right? The kids of the baby boomers turn 45. Okay. Then mm. we can get productivity enhancement again. We're still about 15, 16 years away from that. So it's not looking good. Yeah. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions coming in. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Well, they can but, email me. They can yeah, send them on my okay. Twitter. They can DM me. Um, well, I, I love questions, but. Uh, great. Okay. Well, we'll try to cover some of them and maybe try to loop them all together, bunch them together. Um, so we have one, which is, and I want to get your take on China with this as well. So yeah. American tech companies are getting bigger and bigger outside of the U.S. So don't you think that ph- phenomenon might continue? And then maybe you compare that with what you see Chinese or the future for China specific tech companies and where that's going like 10. Yeah. Look, uh, it's, again, really great question. The problem right now is because of fear and because of, of lack of understanding, again, by our administration. When I say administration, I don't mean the president. I mean the president and the Senate and the Congress. That whole group of mostly white guys. There are some women too, but, but mostly white guys. They live in the wrong world. They live in this you know, inward-focused, nationalistic, populistic world and they're fighting a fight that we can't win. And it goes around tech. So tech evolves over time and we're on the cusp of this technological evolution into the internet of everything where everything in the world is is connected, right? So we went from mainframe computers in the 50s to the microchip and small computers to personal computers in 82 to the internet in 96 to the mobile net in 2010. And now in 2024, we're gonna have this internet of value all around blockchain technology and Mm. everything in the world be connected. And so 10 years ago, you kind of had to choose what technology did you want to be expert in? And America, unfortunately, chose social media. So we're awesome at Facebook and Instagram. We're awesome. China chose AI and 5G. So they are killing it in those areas, particularly 5G. And 5G is the key because 5G is what allows connectivity everywhere. Think about a driverless car. Would you get in a driverless car if it had the same reliability as your cell phone that drops a call every third mile? No, you'd never, because you need 100% all-time connectivity because if the car disconnects from the network, you could crash and die. So you need 5G is really, really important. And you need algorithms that can learn in a true AI way. So China's leading. And so the US is saying, China's bad, China's evil. We're going to spread rumors about them that aren't true. We're going to say they're stealing from us. No, we're stealing from them because they have better technology. And yes, the US companies are more global, but they're reaching a saturation point. And now it's time to flip into this new era of 5G and AI But what's happening instead is we're creating two camps. And unfortunately, what I think is going to happen is we're going to have two internets, which is the worst Mm. possible outcome. We're going to have a Chinese-centric internet all over Southeast Asia because they have been brilliant in doing the Belt and Road Initiative and going into Pakistan and India and Southeast Asia and Indonesia, where there are billions of people now all going to be interconnected like the recreation of the Silk Road and America, little part of South America and Western Europe are going to be one area. That's a couple billion people. Theirs is going to be bigger, better, better data, more, faster, better technology. And we're playing catch up. 
And rather than collaborate, imagine this. Imagine if China said tomorrow that Apple can't sell phones in China. That would hurt Apple a lot more than we could ever hurt them. And what, what we're missing, and I'll, 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 I'll end here because it's a long answer. But <laughs> you know the story of Singapore, right? Singapore was under attack from the Japanese and Singapore is an isthmus and they had these big giant guns and they knew that Japan was gonna come in by boat and they'd blow their boats out of the water. Well, Japan was like, well, we're not gonna get blown out of the water. We'll just park the boat over here and we'll march over these high mountains and come around and surprise them from the back. So the guns were pointed the wrong way. So Japan took over Singapore. Now, the same things happen in, in the US. We're fighting the wrong war. We're fighting as if it's all about made in China, about losing jobs to China. 20 years ago, my friend, his daughter came up to him and said, Daddy, I thought you said Santa Claus brings the presents. Well, they do, honey, why? Well, why do they all say made in China? Okay, so 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that's what it was all about. We outsourced our jobs and our pollution to China. Okay, and we got back cheap stuff, so our quality of life went up. We all had gadgets and gizmos and they were really cheap and it was awesome. Well, now we're still thinking that it's about made in China. Now they've gone from a manufacturing powerhouse like we were post-World War II, and for the next 50 years, we became a consumer powerhouse. They are gonna go from manufacturing powerhouse to the biggest consumptive force the world has ever seen. So we should be focused on making stuff to sell to them, and we should want to be friends, not enemies. It's not hard. It's definitely a, a major shifting dynamic that we've had. Mark, I want to thank you so much. We're at our 45 minute yeah, mark. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, I talk too much. I give long answers. I always say I don't do short. Uh, so I apologize. But no, uh, that was great. I love, thank you. I love talking with you because you have, you have yeah. the best questions. You do your homework. <laughs> and uh, I can talk to you all day. Oh, people yeah. are asking, people yeah, are asking you, where, you, where they can find you. And on the Trader Summit website, you can find uh, everything. I mean, his social media, his website, um, and, and Mark is always available on uh, Twitter as well. I can tell you from experience, if you want to throw him a message, he's going to answer. And, and Mark, that's what regarding... Me, actually, truly, I'll tell you how, how great it is and how I love, I love Twitter as a tool. So, you know, I've met the greatest people. I've met people in Greece. I've met with the presidents of Greek banks because of Twitter. Uh, but today, uh, just to, to make it more personal, so my son and I have been playing Pokemon Go. And there's this thing in Pokemon Go where you have to coordinate, but there's no direct messaging inside Pokemon Go. So a woman direct messaged me on Twitter and said, hey, we need to coordinate this thing. And I'm like, perfect. So life is good on direct message on Twitter. So at Mark Yusko, if you care. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and you know, Mark, I'm from Chicago. I know snowflakes. I've seen them freeze and I've seen them melt. Look, I, just full disclosure, no, Dale, that is so good. Here's the thing. <laughs> no one could be happier for Snowflake. It's an yeah. amazing company. They're changing the world. What they do is awesome. I'm so glad my son works there. I'm so proud of, of the company. And I don't mean to cast aspersions on them. They're a fantastic company. The thing that's crazy is what people are willing to pay for valuations. that stock. Valuations yeah. are just not- It has I nothing have, to do with the company. The company I know, amazing. I had to shovel the it. People are and amazing. I didn't get paid much, so anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Shoveling snow in Chicago, that's bad for your health. <laughs> All right, guys. Nice seeing good. you. Thank you, Mark. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yeah. Great, great job, Justine. Can't wait. Great, right, thank you. And Bye -bye. now I'm going to be introducing Aaron Hunziker from MTI for a short presentation, one of our sponsors. Oh, can everybody hear me loud and clear? Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hello. Good, I'm doing great today. Fantastic so far. How's everybody All right, doing well, out there? We want to thank you for being a sponsor of the Trader Summit. We are and proud to be here, excited to be here. Okay. So take it away. Looks like you have a little PowerPoint here and tell us about MTI. Of course, we are prepared. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. That was fantastic okay. by Mark. Danielle was, Mark, was awesome as well. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the weekend. Uh, I get to talk about uh, one of my passions, obviously, the Forex market, but also uh, the company that I've been part of for seven years, Market Traders Institute. And there's a lot of tremendous traders, information, um, great opportunity throughout the entire weekend. I want to talk about our little niche and who we are 
in what we do. Um, we just celebrated our 26 year anniversary as being one of the leaders uh, of Forex education, uh, technology education in the, in the industry uh, and mentoring and coaching. And I, I'll give you a little bit of a kind of a feedback or kind of a, a picture of who we are in our niche, a little bit different, um, but quickly, just real fast about me. I know a lot of the people on the panel here as well today, which is really cool. Uh, a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time. I've been involved in the financial services industry for 27 years, traded every asset class. I uh, love what I do, passionate about who we are. Now, Market Traders Institute, again, our niche in the industry is we have our own approach towards how we've built uh, and trained tens of thousands of traders around the world over the past 26 years. Uh, we have students in 122 countries that are Forex traders, work with us side by side in these markets. And our approach towards building skilled Forex traders is really threefold. Number one, world-class education. Uh, we've got brilliant education development of technology, software, trading platforms, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that, uh, mentorship and coaching. And we've really expanded recently as we've launched a sister company, as now we've become a real true one-stop shop with our own broker as well, one, two, three, trade. So uh, based out of Central Florida, Orlando, Florida, as I said, just celebrated 26 years. We're founded by this guy right here. Most people know him throughout the Forex world, the FX chief, Jared Martinez, a uh, legend in this industry, a trading pioneer, best-selling author, teacher, mentor, uh, works with our traders, our students, just about every single day. In fact, he's trading live right now with the group of students in his private trading room. I'm um, excited to get you guys going and talk a little bit more about some of the trading rooms that we have. But our approach, our philosophy, what we like to call our proven process is one that we follow diligently in how we create what we believe is our successful traders. And what it, part of that is, is a certification process. Uh, we're one of the only places you can go to actually get a Forex certification. And what this means is we all know that now there's many different styles of trading. There's different time frames. There's technical traders, fundamental traders, how you blend those all together, intermediate, long-term scalpers, all sorts of different trading styles. So we've built a pathway for individuals to discover what's their best fit, what's their best style of trading. And there's a process we've developed to be certified along the way. And there's a lot of benefits in that. And if you're interested in that, you can learn more about that as our website, markettraders.com. But really our approach built around education, software development of applications, mentorship, and live training. So just to give you kind of an overview, as a new student and how people come on board to our organization, uh, our flagship program where they all start is our foundation to build our students up is what is called the Ultimate Traders Package On Demand. And it's really broken into five phases. Phase number one, all of our students who come on board, first and foremost, go through live 20 hours of education, not live trading, education with our team. It is live market in a sense that we're live in the market teaching. We call that our two-day wealth and freedom experience live. But there's an ongoing education component to this too. Uh, we just did an extensive build out about a year and a half ago in our back office and our website, spent a lot of money in developing our education portal. It's brilliant on-demand education that our students go through. It's actually hosted by Jared Martinez, the FX chief himself. So there's always that constant education process to trading that our students go through. Uh, one of the exciting things we've done over the last couple of years is develop our own trading platform, Smart Trader which is really starting to carve out its niche in the industry globally, uh, not only in the Forex market, but in, in the stock market. Uh, we can get stock feeds and trade our stocks. We can trade cryptos off of this. I'm really proud of our new technology that we've developed through Smart Trader. And what's really unique that we've built out through our Smart Trader concept is that we actually broadcast our live trading rooms right off of our platform. And then you're gonna see that's a real backbone to the success of our students is our analysts live in the trading rooms, trading side by side with our students. So not only have we built this robust, beautiful trading platform with our own proprietary trading tools, smart tools, innovation, automated systems, um, it's brilliant technology, but now we're live in the market with our students in there. But to me, the biggest thing that really, I think separates it's very uniquely is, is those live rooms, the live trading, the mentorship and the coaching that we, we do with our students really around the world, the hours on a weekly basis that we trade live, 
Um, and just a, a little bit of, of our team that you'll get a chance to work with if you ever try to come on board and, and, and test drive us for a period of time. You're all going to get a chance to see Chris Pulver tomorrow. Uh, Chris Pulver runs a training room called the Flex Trading Room. Fantastic trader, fantastic teacher. You'll see tomorrow when you hear him. But he's just the beginning uh, of the team of experts that go live in the market uh, with our students day in, day out hundreds of hours a week of live training and analysis with our students, uh, analysts on demand where we reach our students in every market open around the world, and it's these trading rooms. This is really where the, the, the opportunity is created, and, and we've got different trading rooms for different styles, and this is part of our certification process of figuring what's the best fit for our traders individually. Um, and our traders get an opportunity to experience all these different trading rooms. But everybody from Jared Martinez to Chris Pulver, Gary Fickhart, a well-known throughout the industry, Tyson Clayton, uh, a lot of experience. That's one thing you'll find out with our organization. Not only have we been a company for 26 years, but the combined experience of our team, uh, phenomenal. But at the end of the day, it's all about the results. And we're really proud of the experience, the passion that the, 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 the mentors, the analysts bring, but it's the pips, it's the profits. At the end of the day, those are the types of results that our students are achieving in these different trading rooms, trading different styles. And that's, that's really unique to get this and put it out, be very transparent about this. And obviously, Jared Martinez and every student that comes on board in our organization gets a chance to work with Jared Martinez in his mentorship program. Uh, he's excellent in the psychology of trading, obviously trading itself and getting results, but the psychology of trading, which we all know for those of you that are traders that are out there, the emotional roller coaster that we go on trading these markets, especially the currency market, and he's brilliant at breaking that down. So you'll all get a chance to experience that for those of you that invest into us a little bit more and explore us a little bit more. But the results, again, it's about the results of what our students achieve. Automation, we're big believers in hyper trading styles and automated systems. So we develop our own, in addition to our trading platforms, our own automated systems, smart scripts, great technology. Um, you can check out smarttrader.com to get an opportunity to go ahead and use that. But I mentioned this before, this is something we're really proud of. You know, our approach is to never leave a student alone in the market. That's why we're committed to every market open around the world to be live in our analysts on demand room where we can be there so no student has to open up their charting softwares, be it on their phones, their tablets, in their office, wherever they be, because everything we do is mobile. It's a mobile world. Our technology all works mobile. Students in 122 countries and a very unique way that we support them is that live market training, every market open around the world. And we're really proud uh, to, to recently have our sister company launched, which is 123 Trade. We now have the last kind of missing component that we had into becoming that true full. One hey, time. I'm so I'm logged on. Do I, what do I do? Somebody's logging in and screaming over. Uh, hey, hey, Tracy. Um, so we'll call anyway, you in five minutes. Tracy, I'll be done in about a minute. You sound excited like you're ready to go. All right, so one, two, three, trade. We're really excited to announce this. This is our sister company where we've now kind of put that last piece to the puzzle to become that full one-stop shop. Truly, everything from the education to the trading platform to the live trading room to mapping out how the students decide what's the best fit for their style. And now we've filled in that last component being a broker as well. So we're excited to do that. So if you're interested in learning about more of who we are, our history, the results, um, I would encourage all of you to go to Trustpilot. It's an awesome opportunity to go ahead and see kind of what the people say about us out there. We're very proud of the results that we get on here, the people reporting about our trading rooms, our results. And also you'll get to see a lot of results throughout our family member traders because at the end of the day, it's about the traders making pips and profits. So I would encourage you as well, markettraders.com ton of information on there. That website will lead you to um, our brokerage account, our trading platforms, everything that we do as an organization. Uh, and you'll see more about Chris Pulver on there. The gentleman I talked about earlier, Chris Pulver, who runs our Flex Trading Room, don't miss him tomorrow. Our students 
are so loyal to him. He's leading such incredible results in his trading room. I'm excited for you to see how he does it tomorrow and the way that he approaches these markets pretty special. So again, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Markettraders.com. I'll pass it back to you, Dale. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank, thank you, you very Adam. much, Aaron. Nice, nice presentation. And now, live from Canada, the one and only Tracy Shukart. And Justine will be talking to Tracy. Hey, welcome hey, back, Tracy. Justine. Hey, Hi, Tracy. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to our Traders Summit. Hey, thanks for having me, my favorite group over there. Uh, yeah, nice to have you. And I'm going to TO it to Justine. And sure. looking forward to what you guys have to say. Absolutely. Go Just ahead, so you Justine. guys know, we're still we're still seeing Aaron's screen. I don't know if Aaron can stop sharing. Ah, there perfect. you go. There you go. Uh, I, I fixed um, that. Thank you. <laughs> On the text side. Um, all right, Tracy, great to have you here. I'll give you a quick introduction. Uh, so Tracy Shoe Chart is a very successful independent energy trader, and she also recently joined Hedge Fund Telemetry as their energy commodities analyst. Um, and she's also the person behind Chai Girl on Twitter. I've heard it pronounced a million different ways. Chai Tracy, Girl, yes. Chai Girl, okay. <laughs> Chicago Girl, Chai Girl. Oh, okay. So there's <laughs> there's Chinese pronunciations of CHI. There's all sorts of, so, okay. But it's no. Chicago Girl. <laughs> Chicago Girl, so Chai Girl. <laughs> Chai Girl, great. Okay, well, great to have you here. And your expertise is energy. But before we get into energy and directly, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, currencies and currencies are very much intertwined with uh with energy and all the markets um so could you talk about your stance as a dollar bull um, right. and how how that's played out so far well as, i mean as you know um i well i'm pretty vocal dollar bull um but you know even though we have seen a decline somewhat in in the dollar and it's it's been kind of soft obviously that doesn't necessarily mean that um the dollar is weak against other currencies mm -hmm. So um, especially if you're talking about particularly um, once we saw the oil decline, right, negative 37, um, you know, you have uh, oil producing nations that emerging market oil producing nations um, that have high dollar denominated debt have a dollar shortage problem. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you were um, long the dollar against say the Brazilian real or the Argentine peso or the Kenyan uh, shilling, then those would have been, those have been very good trades this year um, as well as the Russian ruble and um, uh, the Turkish lira, which everybody's that's fascinated with right now. <laughs> so, so when you say you're a dollar bull, you're not just strictly looking at DXY. You're looking Correct. at the dollar compared to very specific currencies. Right. Yeah. Um, though I just did, um, I just did get long um, outright dollar futures on Sunday, mm. um, really because, well, you, you know, I, I because I know that there is a dollar shortage in this world and, uh, you know, and basically those funding problems exist on offshore dollars, right? In the Euro dollar market, which the Fed doesn't have control of. Mm -hmm. And so the Fed tried to sort of put a bandaid over this issue by uh, issuing swap lines to a bunch of countries. And it, it did help, but the underlying market is so much larger and out of Fed's control that eventually it was gonna catch up. So, um, you know, and things, you know, uh, demographics and debt being deflationary that I think Mark Yusko just, just talked about. Um, so combining all of that, and then we just kind of had a technical, a beautiful technical setup. Um, you know, where there was, we had a rounding bottom with a bull flag, I guess you could call it a cup and handle if you wanted. Uh, but so it was just the perfect setup. And so I actually did get long outright USD, whereas mm. um, earlier this year, I've been playing it against other currencies. Interesting. So the, the overarching problem, though, for a lot of these emerging markets is that especially if they're dependent on oil and oil prices drop, they can't pay off their debt um, and their debt is in U.S. dollars. So then that pushes the dollar up. So that's the sort of cycle that you're you're looking at. Right. Exactly. 
So then what, let's take a look, because you mentioned five currencies. Um, can we take a little closer look at Brazil um, with the real? Are there specifics, uh, in, are you looking at it mostly in the lens of oil or are there other issues going on in the country that you're Well, there are, I, I, there's definitely other issues going on in the country, mm. but um, for me, it was, a, it, it was a pure oil play. It was mm. a pure oil play, really. Mm. That's all, I, that, was, and that was earlier this year in June um, that we kind of got that, that spike. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of flattened out a little bit since then. Uh, but that was just a pure kind of oil play. And same, same with the peso. Interesting. And I would imagine for the ruble as well, that would be an oil play too. Yeah. I mean, yeah for the Russian ruble. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, and the for the Kenyan shilling, really. Really all of them. <laughs> <laughs> really all of them. And then Turkey obviously, you know, has their own issues. And, you know, it's trading at like, what, seven, six right now. Um, and I actually think it could go to 10. Uh-huh. Interesting. Because of other, other problems that are going on that we, we, we can get into later. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's, let's definitely talk about Turkey. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about that later. Now, I would like to focus a little bit on the, the U.S. and what you see going on in the U.S., especially in terms of fracking and the shale markets. Uh, where do you see that going? Um, do you see much more downside? Any upside? <laughs> Well, I actually, um, I, I actually am finally for the first time in five years, uh, I'm actually an oil bull. I know mm. shocking people. I, I don't want to shock anyone. Um, but I am actually an oil bull. I do think that, you know, I, I was speaking about this last year in December with um, Danielle on Real Vision. Um, and we were highlighting the problems within the industry, um, you know, where we foresaw a lot more bankruptcies and mergers and acquisitions and things just because of the, the way that those com companies were structured and they never kind of completely uh, restructured correctly and they just kept making the same mistakes from the last from the 2014 2016 sort of oil crash mm -hmm. um so that that i already thought would be you know all of 2020 and then covid came along so you know that that was just a double whammy on on the industry in general and kind of sped everything up so uh, you know now we're seeing a and it kind of lengthened it it, it kind of lengthen but shorten the timeline because now we see mm -hmm. all these uh, bankruptcies and we're starting to see a lot more mergers and acquisitions. Maybe those would have taken, you know, six to 12 months uh, longer without COVID. And now, you know, it's kind of, kind of having a waterfall effect, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, right? But speaking on the longer term, I mean, looking at, uh, and then I should say, I'll start with the, sh the near term. So the near term, sure. I think, you know, for this, for the remainder of this year, I think we're basically range bound for, from where, where we've been, you know, in that 30 to $40 range. I don't think we're, uh, you know, I, and I'm on the upper end of that range actually for the, for the rest of the year. Mm. Um, next year, I think we'll inch a little bit higher. And then I'm looking out to, you know, 2022, 2023, where I really think that we could have a big supply problem. We can have a supply. We had a demand problem with COVID, right? And oil prices sank. I think we're actually going to have a supply problem, a supply crunch because of, um, because all of these companies had to reduce CapEx and th things of that nature. And if you look at the shale industry in particular, um, those wells have high, very high decline rates meaning mm -hmm. you have to keep drilling constantly. You have to keep um, more wells in your pipeline, right? So as soon as you cut back on CapEx and you slow down on production, you're uh, cutting your future, your future supply, basically. Mm -hmm. So with, a, and, as, and not even just Shell, or not the Shell industry, but you know, every major everywhere, everybody globally, um, has cut capex and reduced production. Um, so I do think that looking out, um, you know, over the next two to five years, that we could definitely see um, a, a spike in in oil prices. Hmm. Do you think it's 
too early to invest in some of these shale companies, especially because we haven't fully seen the whole fallout. Um, there have been 57 bankruptcies this year. Um, there's, re, um, there's been product, uh, predictions that there, there's going to be a total of 150. And so do you, would you wait until you see more fallout before actually stepping into this area? I mean, I think that, I mean, the oil, I mean, I mean, if you look at any of the, the, the charts, I mean, oil's, it's, I mean, it's the most hated <laughs> in, industry right now. And, you know, it's the, I mean, you know, it went from like 20% of the S and P to, you know, like two and a half percent in waiting wise. Right. So, I mean, I, we're already kind of nibbling at certain companies, but you definitely have to do your due diligence, you know, mm -hmm. as far as what, what you're really willing to invest in. Um, but, you know, you know, at 80 to 90% off, there are some really good deals out there if you can, you know, if you're, if you can weather a little bit, right? And if mm -hmm. it's for a lot, it's certainly not a trader's trade right now. It's definitely more of an investment. It would be more an investment trade, like something you're willing to hold on to for, you know, two, three, five years. Now, the, a lot of the uh, shale companies have been getting funding or were, let's say, several years ago, we're getting funding from banks. That dynamic has shifted because banks got a little bit contracted a little bit, didn't want to lend so much. And so it's been venture capital money. Where Where is the money been coming from for these so, shale Yeah. So th then you had private equity, right? Okay. So all, the, all, uh, all the private equity guys got involved um, and then, you know, they're getting burned. So, you know, hmm. capital is... Is it's hard to come by for these companies right now, right? Interesting. I mean, it is, you know, they're still they're still struggling. Struggling. I mean, another group is, you know, I'm sure another group will come fill the void, just like when the banks said, "No, we don't want any more. We got we got burned this time, right?" And private equity went, well, "We have so much money. What do we do?" You know, this was 2016. We have so much money. What are we going to do with this? Where do we spend this? I mean, that's all you were hearing in 2016. Now, how the, all these guys had so much money, and you're kind of hearing that about uh, VC companies now. So uh, perhaps you know, venture capitalists who want, want to get involved. Yeah. Okay. So you you do see somebody stepping up to the plate at some point. I mean, it's the cycle, right? Mm -hmm. It's the cycle that yeah. goes through. But I'm sure that money will be funded somehow um, in the industry. And, you know, I mean, and Washington is also talking about uh, making laws saying that, you know, banks can't be biased against uh, energy players and things like that. So there is a uh, chance that, you know, governments will, the government will step in with some sort of regulation, whether you agree that with that or not. Um, you know, it, it is a, you know, the industry is big in the United States and provides a lot of jobs and and uh, things of that nature and peripheral jobs around all those uh, cities that that are oil producing. So, mm -hmm. well, we do have a question here from Stephanie. Um, she's asking, what would be the best way to play oil, given that it's a commodity? And if you happen to have any thoughts on this, what do you think of Berkshire buying Suncor? If you can follow. Um, I think Berkshire buying Suncor is great. I'm in Canada right now. So, you know, I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, but they're, I mean, they're an integrated company. So, you know, I think that's, you know, I, I really happen to like that company too. So, you know, if, if Warren likes it, I like, uh, you know, I'm cool with that. You're on board. Well, <laughs> and as far as energy plays, I mean, energy is a commodity. I wouldn't suggest most people go out and trade oil futures. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there are, you can, there are, uh, if you want to do something like XLE, that's not just pure oil, it's, it's mostly uh, Exxon and uh, Chevron, um, and, but, and then with some other things mixed in. So, you know, there's a way you can play it like that, or you can, you know, be an individual stock, you know, see individual stocks at companies that you like, you know, if, if you're, this is your first foray into the energy markets, you know, I would suggest picking like a big integrated company, like, you know, uh, one of the majors that, you know, is going to be around. <laughs> <laughs> that, that won't, won't die in this uh, <laughs> recession. Um, so what do you, well, uh, we have another question here um, about, biofuel, hydrogen, do you see any of these as harming oil demand? Are those, is that something that you've been following at all? 
Um, yeah, I mean, a little bit. Obviously, you know, ethanol has been a, around for a while. Um, and, you know, uh, Chevron and a couple other are changing over some uh, refineries in uh, California. Um, but I don't see it as, you know, a major competition. If, if that's, I'm not exactly sure the question. I, I mm. think there's room in the market for it, especially um, in the California markets where they have very stringent laws and uh, things of that nature. Um, but for right now, I see it probably very localized to certain states that um, sort of have stricter laws concerning emissions. Great. And let's take one more question before we move on to geopolitics. Um, so from Cliff, he's asking, what what about some of the pipeline companies um energy transfer for example is that something that you're following energy pipelines um yeah i, I mean absolutely i mean i look at um at all of them um you know i mean energy transfers obviously been having a lot of problems um kmi had problems they sold off their problems um so if, i mean if you're looking to invest in and pipeline companies, again, do your research because there's a lot of issues going on, especially, you know, uh, along the U.S.-Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And um, let's get into some geopolitics. You mentioned Turkey at the top. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about what your view is on, I guess, that Mediterranean corridor uh, and right. energy specifically. Right. So basically, uh, I'm definitely watching the Mediterranean corridor because um, it, it can really completely change uh, the oil flow, the oil and gas flows within the region, as well as change some fundamental policy there. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm heard the EU is mulling sanctions against Turkey over drilling and exploration in Cyprus. Um, mm -hmm. Turkey is a NATO member, so that would be a huge shift in, in policy. However, you do need a unanimous vote for this. Um, so we have Greece, uh, Cyprus, and France right now versus Italy, Malta, and Spain. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if Italy swings towards France, then likely Spain and uh, Malta will follow and they'll get the un unanimous vote that they need. Again, a huge mm. policy change. Um, right now, it's um, it's Italy's energy interests in Libya that that will determine whether Rome kind of swings towards France um, or not, because Libya's civil wars kind of p has pitted France and Egypt uh, against Turkey, um, and Italy up until now has sided with Turkey out of just pure energy, out of just a pure energy um, interest. Um, hmm. But Turkey's getting very aggressive um, in, in, in Libya right now. And it's outsized military presence is really turning kind of Italy off right now. Um, so this could swing Italy in favor of France being that ENI, they're there for ENI, and ENI is uh, the Italian oil company. Um, it's almost like nationalized there. It's mm. you know, supremely important to their com company, country, and so they don't want um, they don't want to be subject to sort of Turkey's dictates um, within Libya. So hmm. really, so why does this all matter, right? <laughs> um, well, for one, um, sanctions could really exacerbate and heighten tensions um, in the Mediterranean, um, potentially leaving the door open for Turkey to be an aggressor closer to home, which hmm. would be ungood, right? And two, it completely changes the, the, um, the oil route significantly. Um, because it would make it makes Egypt a central clearinghouse for European and African uh, gas, mm -hmm. which is a made which is a major setback for for uh, Ankara because they had hopes of being that regional hub for uh, European gas flows. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, as recently as uh, yeah, in fact, as recently as last week was it? Yeah. Um, there was an oil co or a gas coalition formed with um, with Turkey, or I'm no, sorry, <laughs> without Turkey, um, mm. which was um, without Turkey, which was uh, Greece, Italy, Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, and Jordan. Um, so right now, Turkey's kind of being shut out of uh, that area. That area. So um, 
that in fact means that there's no whole role for Turkey's pipeline um, mm. that was supposed to be uh, the clearinghouse um, to go into to Europe, which brings the forefront to now Israel's pipeline, brings Israel's pipeline to the forefront, right? Um, Interesting. So, so, so do you see, I mean, do you see that putting potentially upward pressure on oil prices if, if, there, if sanctions do go through? If sanctions do go through, no, I because this is more of a gas play. Okay. Um, but really, basically, this whole this whole thing, this whole background I gave you. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what does it really mean for investors or traders? Um, basically, this means you know there's um, you know there's an increasing investment opportunities in Egypt now, um, mm-hmm. rather rather than Turkey, and in particular in Israel, because Israel, as you know, it's rich in natural gas. They also just had peace accords with several of their Arab nations, which secures their energy, um, their energy place in the region. Um, So right now, a lot of companies are sort of clamoring um, to get into this uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas market. Mm -hmm. Um, So some of the companies that we're looking at um, that would hugely benefit from this um, would be Zion Oil and Gas, Delic Group, Bellic Grilling, uh, Ratio Oil Exploration, um, Energian, Chevron, and Noble Energy. Now, Mm. the big thing we need to pay attention to right now as far as um, Noble Energy is concerned is um, Chevron is talking about a merger with Noble Energy specifically because they want their East Med assets. Mm. Um, This meeting happens on October 2nd. So um, this could be a big change and, you know, could be a big boost for uh, their stock prices. Interesting. Okay, so there are a bunch of factors going on there. One is, you know, whether there's issues in Turkey, two is, uh, and sanctions specifically, two is whether there's more deals, peace deals with Israel um, and and more um, regional peace. And then the third thing is what's going on with Chevron and and actually completing that deal. Right. Yeah, okay. That's what we're kind of looking at as far as opportunities in the region. mm Mm-hmm. But but for the other companies like Zion Oil and Gas um, and Delac, yeah. what would you say is like, uh, is, are those just plays specifically based on increasing peace as well as potential yeah, sanctions? Yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. Because, they, you know, their stock prices will definitely get a boost over this um, now that all these doors are, are open um, without... Um, sort of people getting in the way of it. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Right. And actually there's even been, there was an announcement today that, um, so Israel inked a few deals, uh, peace deals. So one with the UAE and one right. with, um, Bahrain. Um, and now there's news that in the coming days, they might ink another peace deal as well. So it's sort of, I guess, a continuing story. Exactly. There. Exactly. And so I, I, we just think there's a lot of opportunity, um, in that region right now for, um, investments. And those, again, are just some of the companies that, um, you know, I think that will, you know, that will definitely gain from um, everything that's happening there right now. And before we go on to the next geopolitical area, we do have some questions coming in that I want to get to. Um, so this is from Omar. He says, whatever happened to the hype about peak oil? It seems to have gone <laughs> away lately. Do you think peak oil is now nearer or farther away. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that was a 2008. <laughs> and, yeah, it was like a long time ago. We had peak oil, then we had peak demand. And so really, I don't, you know, I think it's, you know, the, the, those bud wor- buzzwords tend to, to come and go. But mm-hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think it's still, there's no peak, there's no peak oil. <laughs> And you know, it's not, well, I feel like shale specifically disrupted that. And so. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's going to take them a while to, you know, get back up. They and they may, we may never get back up to exactly the levels that we were um, in 2019, um, which again, you know, only reinforces, you know, kind of the bullish, less supply. Mm -hmm. Now, we have another question from Dan, who says, given the U.S. political climate issues in the Middle East, pipeline uh, and competition in Europe, Turkish ambitions, (laughs) how much is risk skewing the fundamentals? As far as, I mean, as far as, are you asking if, like, I mean, are they making... 
Price is higher or I, I would imagine. I mean, so yeah, let's go with that. Like, do you, do you see that potentially pushing prices higher? I don't like not necessarily. I mean, I think the, the, the well, there's always geopolitical risk with oil, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a factor of the na the nature of the commodity. Um, but I think what's happening in the Middle East, really, I think you have. Um, I think it's actually um, you know more positive, not only in the way that I think that things are getting better, right? And instead of getting worse, like mm -hmm. I don't think that Turkey doesn't really produce you know, enough of oil or gas to make any difference. And so even if everybody had sanctions against them, they're not really, they're not a player in the market. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the good things that are happening sort of outweigh any kind of risk of Turkey being, you know, out of, out or sanctioned out of the, the market. Gotcha. Now we do have a few questions about China coming in. Um, what happens to the economy and I guess also oil markets um, in the case of like any sort of uh, battle or issues between China and the US? And then I guess looping in another question is how much um, attention should be paid between China and India, um, especially in terms of oil trading as well as like any sort of military exercise activities and issues there? Well, I definitely, I mean, I don't think that, you know, I know there's a lot of hype in the media. I don't foresee any actual physical confrontation between the United States and China at any time soon. I just, you know, um, militarily wise, I just don't see that happen. You might see, you know, you see them buzz each other, you know, in the South China Sea and you hear of these things, but I personally don't think that it will escalate to any, anything higher than that as far as the United States and China is, you know, clashing is concern. Um, China and India is definitely some area that you you definitely want want to watch. Um, in the case, you know, in the case of, you know, something happening in say the United States had to pick sides, the United States already, um, you know, already has alliances with India and already has a lot of oil deals with India. Um, and so India, you know, it, the U.S. wouldn't lose any business that way. You know, as far as China is concerned, they're just starting to buy a lot more, but really they're not uh, the U.S. main customer. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and Russia are really their big suppliers. So mm -hmm. we're kind of a secondary market to them. So it wouldn't really affect um, the United States so much. Now, we do have another interesting one coming in about a question coming in about China. Do you have any thoughts or perspective on China's yuan denominated oil contracts and what that actually might do to U.S. Price, that US will depricing do of Middle Eastern I, oil? <laughs> I think it'll do absolutely nothing. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely nothing. I know I've, I've had arguments. Lots of okay. goodness. <laughs> um, but I absolutely think it means nothing there. Uh, oh. The volume isn't that big. They actually don't deliver. It's not, you know, they don't deliver that much. Um, it's a deliverable contract, but they don't really deliver that much. Um, and it really hasn't, uh, hasn't really affected the, the market, so to speak. Hmm. Um, because it's not their, you know, it's not their oil either, right? It's Middle East oil that they store, that they resell. Um, you mm -hmm. know, China doesn't, again, China is not even a big producer. I mean, they've produced uh, 3.4 million barrels a day. This is nothing. So. Right. So you don't suddenly see everything getting priced in yuan in the future. You no, know, so that's I taking don't. Over the dollar. And even, okay. it, okay. and even if it did, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that these companies like say, say BP, for example, just made a delivery there. Well, BP was paid in dollars. They, mm -hmm. they don't accept you on for payment. So they're paid in dollars. They jump it off and, you know, China sells it you know, in yuan. And so perhaps you purchase it in yuan, then you go right around and turn it back into dollars because nobody wants yuan. <laughs> mm. Yet, yet. <laughs> All right, we have a few more questions. Um, one is, or actually we have a few about the election, and then I want to move on to some of our <laughs> other geopolitical spots. Um, so do you see Biden winning as bullish or bearish for WTI, or does it even matter who wins? Um, I think that, um, I, you know, I think that if you look at Biden's track record, he's really actually the most pro-oil Democrat of all, 
right? He was um, when the first Arctic, he was in office when the first Arctic drilling permits were um, were sent. He's he's backed every bill for um, for the oil industry. So he's actually really pro pro energy. So, but sh you know, should should we have a foreign policy change if there is um, you know a new uh, a new party in office. Um, many of the companies have already, you know, what they were talking about is uh, they would not allow new permits on federal lands because really they can't do anything about s states can do whatever they want. They can do something about federal lands. That's mm -hmm. fine. But ahead of the, of the election, pretty much every company has come right out and said, we're already buying, you know, we're already grabbing up every lease we can on federal lands just in case this happens. So I don't think that um, it, it would uh, really change the, change the dynamic as much as people think, right? Interesting. And Personally. so do you, do you see anything happening to the dollar during the election as well? Um, I mean, I think, I think, well, I mean, I think leading up to elections, the dollar will bounce, but it is, um, you know, and I, as far as after the election, I mean, I think that really, really depends. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there are disputed results that could. Right. They're, they're, I mean, there could be, a, you know, there's so many things. things to speculate. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> let's move on to some of the, uh, the one geopolitical area we haven't really touched on, which is Africa. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you see going on um, in terms of oil, gas, um, utility demand, et cetera, going on in Africa? Yeah, so we'll start with oil. So basically, um, Angola has been kind of the darling there, right, for the last couple of years, because um, was, there was new deposits found and things like that. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, we could talk about that, but there's not really that much to talk about. But what I do want to talk about <laughs> is um, Mambia, because it's really, it's kind of a thing in the, the industry that not a lot of people are talking about right now. Um, there hasn't been any discoveries yet, but there looks like there could be a potential um, of, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of oil, um, to be found. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, right now, you know, there's kind of a race to be the first to, you know, discover oil there. So um, companies there that I'm watching um, are uh, Renas Reconnaissance Energy, mm -hmm. um, Eco Atlantic, Tullo, and EOG. So those are companies you kind of want to keep an eye on. Um, again, you know, people aren't really talking about it right now. Mm -hmm. So um, and how I long is the opportunity there? How long does, does this process usually take? I mean, could this be in the scale of like many decades, years? <laughs> Are we I talking weeks? Be, I think it'll be sooner than that. I mean, I think, okay. you, know, it, you know, I mean, it does vary. Um, mm. but, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, they started this year. So, you know, basically, you know, you know, one to one to two years, maybe less. Possibly. Okay. Okay. So it's, it won't be. It's not. We're not talking twenty thirty. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm talking about things that like I'm trying mm. to talk about things that are relevant and I what I think are investable now. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Um, and then of course um, there's the whole renewable aspect of of European countries also investing in in areas of Africa. Could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't, I, I mean, I'm a big pro Africa person, but I know that there's a lot of problems trying to invest in the company. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lack of regulation. Um, a lot of people have gotten burned in investments there. Um, so the alternative is you can invest in uh, European utility companies that have invested there. And mm -hmm. why are you a European utility companies investing there. Well, um, you know, they have a big green push right now as, you know, so they started with a big green push um, investing in, you know, solar, wind, um, you know, and, and minerals to, and metals to make those, um, to make those products. Um, and then especially after COVID, it's become even more important because Europe, basically got all of their rare earth metals from China, right? And mm -hmm. now they're looking to diversify, you know, even further. Um, you know, I've talked about supply chain changing and things like that. So there's gonna be a big push 
um, an even bigger push, I should say, um, for some of these utility companies to invest in Africa. So um, instead of directly investing in Africa, you can, in fact, you know, invest in some of these u utility companies. Um, and I'll give you some companies that sure. I think are interesting. <laughs> um, so we have Siemens Energy, which is very inter interesting because they are debuting on the German Borst next week. Um, then there's Droge Energy, um, there's uh, Neon, which is in France, there's Contour Global and Blue Energy in the UK, there's Scatel in uh, Norway, um, there's Enel in uh, Italy, and uh, AMDA in Energy in Spain. Interesting. And so all of these companies are somehow yes. investing in different regions of Africa? Yes, and they're all listed. I mean, they're all uh, listed on an exchange. Too, so. Interesting, interesting. Well, let's turn back to some questions that we've been getting in. Um, I do have a fun one here for you, which is, do you have any recommendations um, on futures, uh, on books about futures or the energy market? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, and, and they're wondering if you will write a book too. So do you have any book recommendations <laughs> and will you write a book? <laughs> I don't know, maybe one day I'll write a book. Um, I don't, there's so many oil books you can, you know, uh, can look at. Oil 101 is always my favorite first book to, you know, kind of um, give out to, to traders because it gives you such a broad, it's by Morgan Downey. Um, it gives you such a broad aspect of sort of the oil industry and um, really how how it's physically traded and um, uh, the difference between the crew grades, like really kind of, you know, gives you a really nice solid background on that. Um, so, you know, and then there's other books like the prize. Um, I've read that one. It's a big, it's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And if you don't want to read it, they, I think they made a special on PBS or something. They did. Nobody they did. It's fantastic. I highly okay. recommend that. I yeah. didn't see that one. All right. So you can catch that there. Yeah. Um, he actually just, Jurgen just actually came mm -hmm. out with a new book. I forget the title, uh, but it's also supposed to be really good. Hmm. Interesting. And then we have a few other questions. Are you following the uranium markets at all, especially at mm -hmm. China and India planning on new plants. Yeah, that's not my market. That's no. not your market. Okay, so we will. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> we will move on from there. Um, what's your view on the end of the year um, and during the elections on technicals um, and in metals? Have you been following metals much? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as far as metals are concerned, you know, I, I trade a lot of platinum, um, you know, um, and and some silver um some gold but mostly platinum you know i think the market's going to be very volatile as you know because i think that i actually think all the markets are going to be very volatile except for oil that just is not moving mm -hmm. but um you know as far as you know because the, because it's you know metals are tied to yeah. rates and um also the markets you know if the markets sell off and your portfolio is upside down what do you do you first thing you sell is your, your metals right um so i think as you know with all the uncertainty coming in the election and who knows what happens after the election but i you know i think that the election is not going to be over when the election is over if you mm -hmm. know what i mean <laughs> mm -hmm. so i think the markets in general are going to have a, a lot of volatility you know, as always, you know, I think it's good to have some gold in your portfolio just to sit on. Um, but I, you know, but I think it'll be volatile enough for traders to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, traders like volatile markets. So <laughs> you mentioned before that you're, a, I guess, long term uh, dollar bull. <laughs> does that necessarily mean that you would be somewhat gold bearish or does that not that doesn't pair up for you? That doesn't pair up for me. I mean, okay. to me, gold is really tied to uh, real rates and not to, I mean, we have seen dollar and gold go up together. Yep. Um, you know, we saw that earlier this year and, and last year. Um, so that the dollar is not a factor for me. I, you know, it's really more about rates. Gotcha. Now we have a question from Mike who asks about the impact of a COVID vaccine on oil and the dollar. You have um, any well, I think, that? you know, I'm not, well, uh, let me say I'm not an actual long, long-term dollar bull. I think eventually, you know, it will come down. I'm just a, a medium term. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dollar bill. Uh, but if we have a COVID vaccine, I'm sure, you know, as far as everything, I think that will calm mm-hmm. all the markets in general. Obviously, for oil, that would be very bullish um, because, you know, then we see people flying again, and, you know, people taking the subways again, people taking, so, you know, definitely um, going to work again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, things would be opening up again. So at, that would be very bullish, in my opinion, um, oil and for, for, for a lot of markets. <laughs> yeah. Now a few more geopolitical questions. I'm curious as to your take on Iran, um, which, and their levels of oil. So we have a question um, asking about new data on oil exports um, released by Iran, um, which has increased significantly. And, and what do you see as the end game for the cat and mouse, um, I guess, war, quote unquote, between the U.S. and Iran? Um, well, I think that, I mean, well, we all know, I mean, we all know Iran's still selling oil, right? Because there's always a way around sanctions. There's always a gray market and a black market. So, you know, they have been selling, you know, I don't know, give or take a million barrels a day somewhere in the world, mostly to China through Malaysia. Um, they're selling finished gasoline to Venezuela right now. Um, they do have a lot of stockpile piled up, right? And so we are noticing that um, some of their offshore floating storage is diminishing. So we do know they're selling it. Um, and th- there's really no way to, to, to stop that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really hasn't made really an impact on the market you know, it's, it's, it's very negligible, um, Mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. And, you know, as far as the future is concerned, you know, my hope is, is that, you know, we come to some sort of, uh, agreement, agreement that, you know, doesn't involve, um, you know, bombs, (laughs) right? (laughs) Hopefully diplomatically, you know, we, we can work this out. And so, you know, we're kind of seeing uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of Iran kind of, uh, kind of uh, being more willing to talk and and things of that nature. So, you know, um, it's not going to be solved tomorrow, but Mm -hmm. you're hopeful. Right. (laughs) Um, Now, what about Libya? Do you have any thoughts in terms of what's going on in Libya, um, as well as um, oil prices there? Well, we kind of talked about that a little bit. I know, Mm. you know, Libya lifted the oil blockade, which is fine. But we also need to watch that with a little bit of caution, because this is kind of this has happened on and off for uh, the last eight months. Um, And, you know, there is a question that they've been offline for eight months, you can't just snap your fingers and bring it online that fast. They also have stockpiles that they need to go through. Um, So, you know, it's an area that oil traders are watching because they were producing uh, like 1.1 million barrels a day before this occurred. Um, And then they were down to about 100,000 barrels per day. Um, Now they're, you know, up to like 250K. So traders are watching the market and, you know, OPEC will adjust accordingly if uh, Libya comes online. But again, that's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, So, you know, if they totally restore oil, you know, within six to eight months, who knows where we'll be in six to eight months, right? Demand could be a totally different issue by then. Now that we're hopping around the world, I want to keep hopping around the world. Um, I'm curious about, we have a question here about what traders and investors should think about the politics um, of Ukraine um, and, and that region. Um, I mean, I, it, it, I, I, what's that specific, I mean, specific question? I mean, there's been kind of ongoing problems. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 there's been ongoing problems in Ukraine um, and that area for, for a very long time. Um, so, I, I mean, I think as far as the market is concerned, sort of that uh, political, geopolitical risk as far as the, you know, gas is concerned and uh, travel through that country, uh, that, that's kind of been factored in already. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, now I want to hop back to Canada. This is before we uh, bring in Dale and, and Steve to see if they have any questions for you. But uh, one final question here is, why did you move to Canada, Canada and uh, not, not stay in Chicago? And wouldn't you change your Twitter handle to Canada Girl or something else? <laughs> no, I, well, <laughs> I can't change my Twitter handle. It's me. Um, oh, okay. And um, I came here for, for a job opportunity. So, and then just ended up staying. You know, I really love Montreal. And so, you know, 
And so here I am. And I love Chicago too, dearly. Um, but you know, uh, right now it's not a place that I want to be. <laughs> well, you should, you should get the Twitter handle at Canada girl, just in case too, who knows, like maybe, <laughs> maybe you'll have two, two accounts. <laughs> Well, anyway, you still have the uh, Tracy still has the <laughs> Chicago accent, though. I know, right? Even though she's know. gone to <laughs> Canada, <laughs> it, it, really nice to see you, Tracy. And uh, wow, I'm telling you, this was a, a great interview. It's the best I've ever heard you. Really Thank outstanding you. job, and and Justine, you know, uh, well, Justine. what a great host. What a great host <laughs> and anchor and the questions you asked uh, really, you know, helped make the interviews. It was a pleasure meeting oh. you and Tracy. Great job. And I don't blame you. I don't want to be in Chicago either. In fact, let me ask you this. Would you want to be anywhere in the U S with what's going on? No, actually I'm okay here. Yeah. hanging out here watching, right? Now. Fix up that guest room, Tracy. All <laughs> Plenty right. Of room. Plenty All of room. right. Anyway, so, uh, I want to thank you guys for adding class to this Trader Summit, both of you, and uh, I hope everyone that was here enjoyed it. It was our mission to uh, bring some ideas. Uh, Tracy, so many different oil stocks. I I've got to get the, the list from you. And your bullish oil, I, I fell off my chair. I know, right? And, and, yeah, and uh, you know, I'm. Uh, it makes me and my intelligence gathering, it made me wonder why crew didn't break with the market this week and I mean, that's another really, reason that's yeah. another reason actually uh, actually dale she's super bullish because if you consider that she's not uh bearish the dollar being right. bullish being bullish crude exactly. is yeah is yeah. a is a very strong signal right yeah well, so, look, oil uh, hasn't moved. The market, the market tanked, right? And yeah, um, and and the dollar is rising, and oil has not moved. <laughs> Have you ever seen a dormant period like this before, Tracy? For this long? And, uh, it's the magical, invisible OPEC hand. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's definitely. I I can't remember. They and they say never sell a sleeping market, and crude is in a coma. So, uh, yeah. Tracy, uh, I don't know if, if that came up today because uh, at, some, at some point I was in a call, so I might have been unlucky and missed it. Um, did, did you comment on the explosive price action on natural gas during the past three days? Um, no, I didn't really talk about it. We had many people today in the webinar. You know, I was showing this amazing price action. First, everybody that was trying to get along again at, at the orderly pullback uh, was stopped out uh, during the past few days. And then we had this, I, I don't remember seeing such a price Boom. action many times in the past. I mean, we went in oh, literally crazy. like 48 hours from $1.8 to $2.9. <laughs> it's crazy market. I think it's not really uh, my forte. I don't really trade, um, you know, not gas futures, but, you know, certainly um, not gone unnoticed. <laughs> the widow maker. They call right, it right. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't have the stomach you know, for that market. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely is. Yeah. is a hard and one. Not, Steve doesn't anymore either. So uh, that's gonna be a wrap <laughs> for our. Uh, hey, wait, it's gonna be a wrap. I just want to say something. Thank you, uh, Tracy, for being here, yeah, and being part ahead. of the Traders Summit, and and Justine. It's wonderful to hear your voice, and uh, I've I've seen a couple of interviews you've done, and you ladies brought a lot of class to this ragtag team of uh, other guys that we have here. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we'll see everyone for day two. Quite a lineup for tomorrow as well, everybody. So Blake and I will be up before the roosters uh, so that we're here at 445, that's 745 Eastern to start day two. Everyone enjoy their evening. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And we'll see everyone for the Trader Summit day two tomorrow morning. Check the site. The schedule is up. It's going to be amazing. Just like today. Uh, so Thank somebody, you, everyone. Somebody just wrote, drinks up, mice down. That reminds yep, that, me. Uh, that's right. Trace's line. <laughs> that's Trace's line. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank Here's you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good job, Steve. Nice job, team.
See you guys later. Thank you, Dale. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of the day. Cheers. Thanks, guys.